morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am Haifa Badir Zaman, Program Manager at the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, which we refer to as HAI. Alongside our co-hosts, Stanford Global Studies, the Center for South Asia, and the Center for African Studies, we wish you a very warm welcome to today's event, Global AI Reframing the Conversation. Our mission at HI is to guide and build the future of AI in a way that benefits humanity. Today's speakers represent a diverse group of scholars, practitioners, and civil society leaders who will expand this conversation beyond the global north to highlight the key values, challenges, and opportunities that the growth of AI brings in global contexts. Before we start today, I want to touch upon a few logistics. We are hosting a total of three panels today with a brief five minute break between each session. You can submit questions for the speakers through the Q&A function in the Zoom. Closed captioning is also available and can be found in the panel at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Now, I would like to introduce our speakers for the first panel, Global Perspectives on Human-Centered AI. Sarita Amrute is the Associate Professor of Strategic Design at Parsons, the new school, and Principal Researcher at the Data and Society Research Institute, where she leads the Trustworthy Infrastructures Program. An anthropologist, Sarita uses ethnographic methods and archival analysis to understand new digital technologies as emerging from long-standing colonial and post-colonial relations of power and political economy, and as contrib contributing to novel forms of race, labor, caste, and capital. Her first book, Encoding Race, Encoding Class, Indian IT Workers in Berlin, received the Diana Forsyth Prize in Anthropology and the International Convention of Asian Studies Book Prize. She is at work on a second ethnography that takes up the relationship between cybersecurity and activist practice in the Indian diaspora, tentatively entitled Staying Safer, Infrastructures of Dissent in the Indian Diaspora. Welcome, Sarita. We also have with us Toussaint Nathias. Toussaint Nathias is a global media scholar working on journalism, civil society, and digital technologies. He is the research director of the Digital Civil Society Lab here at Stanford and a senior schol research scholar at PAX, the Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society. For the past five years, he has been researching efforts by Meta to provide free online access across the global south. He is also currently co-editing with Lucy Bernholz, a book on the impact of AI on freedom of assembly worldwide. At the Digital Civil Society Lab, he has notably led efforts to increase research and community engagement with stakeholders across the African continent. Welcome to Sam. And finally, it's also my great pleasure to introduce Paula Ricorte, who is an associate professor in the Department of Media and Digital Culture at Tecnologico de Monterey and faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. With Nick Poldre and Ulysses Mejias, she founded Tierra Comun, a network of academics, practitioners, and activists interested in decolonizing data. She is a member of the A Plus Alliance for Inclusive Algorithms and leads the Latin American and Caribbean hub of the Feminist AI Research Network. In addition to her academic work, she participates in civil society initiatives to promote digital rights and the development of public interest technologies. She's a member of the A-Plus Alliance for Inclusive Algorithms. Oh, apologies, I'm repeating myself. Um, welcome to our esteemed panel and over to you, Sarita, for kicking off our first session for this morning. Thank you so much, Haifa. That was such a lovely set of introductions. It's a huge honor to be here with some really treasured colleagues who I'm always learning from. Um, I'm going to speak for a little bit, and if I have time, I might try to show some images as well. Um, but I would like to begin today by asking you to join me in situating ourselves. I stand on tra the traditional lands of the Canarsi people on the continent of Turtle Island. I stand on lands further transformed through the labor of migrants, willing, unwilling, 
and ambivalent. And I sit in a room in a home in a city made possible through the work of immigrant labor and made possible by the theft of indigenous lands. As we gather here today, I notice, and I ask you to notice the ongoing erasure of indigenous enslaved people and immigrant workers in building the ethic, the history, and the future of these lands. I begin with this acknowledgement of relationality and complexity in our relationship with each other, with place, and with technologies. And I will return to these orientation points, in other words, of relationality and complexity, but only after I tell you a story of AI and its promises. In ongoing research, I am conducting on caste, race, and the internet, writ broadly. I'm following various projects that use large language models for hate speech and bias detection. In one such project, a team of legal scholars and computer scientists attempt to build a model to rank types of anti-Asian sentiment found on social media platforms. They collect large data sets, recruit students to label the data, and then refine their classificatory, classificatory schema. There's much more involved here, but that's basically the project. At the end of the project, the researchers concluded that if they wanted to achieve a nuanced analysis of anti-Asian sentiment online, the model they had built was an impossibility. It could not classify social media messages with enough granularity to be useful. It could not do much with visual data or sound data. It could not parse the attachments or links to messages that might reveal context, tone, and register. At the end of the project, I interviewed one of the participants who told me that even though the model could not be used on its own, it could perhaps be used to help human moderators sort content for review, which is a very reasonable conclusion. But I want to do a little something else with this story. For me, these types of stories might be over, or for you, the audience, these types of stories might be overly familiar. One could even say overdetermined, but I think they are also very revealing. This vignette usefully crystallizes several contradictions of how AI systems intersect with ongoing relations of power. Several characteristics stand out that are metonymous with the condition of AI systems in the contemporary world. First, such projects are both well-funded and well-intentioned. This fact points to the tremendous funds that are put into AI projects that appear to solve universal problems like hate. They do so though with little consultation of the affected groups and with little thought to how online hate intersects with larger and historical systems of power. All the while they monopolize resources. Second, such projects rely on the painstaking labor of human labor labelers to move forward. This is a well-known fact about AI systems that bears repeating. Humans are not only in the loop, they are the loop. In this case, these humans were student volunteers whose energy was maintained through the belief that they were doing good work for the betterment of society. Um, there's a note here about, there's no, there's no slides, but you should be able to see the speaker. I haven't put up, I haven't started slides yet. Um, Maybe someone in the back end can figure out the audio problem. Um, let's see. So framed in this way, it is easy to overlook the exploitative nature of this free labor, or in other cases, highly underpaid, highly traumatic labor. Third, the glimmer of light at the end of this project, namely that such systems might be used as a help to human content moderation, is extinguished in the political economies of transnational labor arbitrage, coupled with the ideology of AI as a standalone solution to social problems. In other words, one already knows that such systems are used to exert pressure on human moderators to work at speed and to reduce their agency rather than to reduce their workload or enhance decision-making power. This tale, in sum, crystallizes the relationship between AI systems as they develop and long histories of labor, subjectivity, and economy that are themselves embedded in the colonial relationships with which I began. Universities built by expropriating land from indigenous peoples, often erected by unfree labor and maintained by underpaid migrant labor, 
or corporate campuses supported by the same, develop AI systems designed to solve social problems. These systems themselves depend on chains of labor stretched across the globe, rely on tremendous reservoirs of energy, minerals, and infrastructure, and monopolize funds. In the end, and in the best of worlds, these systems may do little to solve the problem for which they were designed. And in the worst, they exacerbate existing problems by solidifying relations of power, empowering corporations, and enabling states to practice digital forms of incarceration and coercion. These systems are put to extractive and exploitative uses, such as devalu devaluing workers across the world, extending surveillance systems, and flooding information channels with hate. To wit, large language models, uh, the most recent examples are the ones you're all familiar with of chat, of, of chat functions. They have serious privacy and uh, adversarial hacking vulnerabilities that have been outlined in several papers, just to, to mention two of them, um, because these systems scrape data and we don't know where it's being scraped from, they may in fact draw into them private information that could easily be queried. And because these systems rely on large language sets that are scraped broadly, they, they can be manipulated by um, troll farms, adversarial actors who want to put out certain content online um, about particular minoritized groups, Muslims, um, caste oppressed people, and so on, that then would be reproduced through these systems. Um, so, so that's all very well known, but I think it's really important to crystallize these problems, even with the most well-intentioned AI systems. These are, aren't only problems that devolve onto corporate uses of AI, but they are within uh, what we could call um, philanthropic or maybe neoliberal or liberal AI systems as well. Um, so the analytic that I've arrived at through such cases as this is a relational one. The developments in AI that we witness are predicated on long histories of economic exploitation, land grabs, racism, sexism, and casteism, to just name a few. Though some might like to think these issues are in the past, this tendency itself, in other words, to narrate these issues as if they'd been overcome, this tendency itself is an effect of discourses around technology that simultaneously lifts up particular technological interventions as quick fixes, and narrows focus on what is considered technology proper, rather than ruminating on the complex context in which a given technology unfolds. So how do we keep this relationality in play when understanding and reimagining AI systems? And here I'm going to share with you a few images of a project I've been working on with two of my colleagues that tries to keep this relationality in play. Um, okay, so um, Paola, who will be speaking later, was one of the contributors to this project, and so I'm thrilled to be on this call with her and and hear, and hear her later. Um, but I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about this piece of work that I produced with uh, many collaborators and two authors, Ranjit Singh and Rigoberto Lara Guzman, called A Primer on AI in and from the Majority World. And what you see right now are the Spanish language and English language covers. We released those both simultaneously. Um, and I think one of, if my founding question here is how do we keep the complex histories that produce AI and its context in play? One of them surely has to be through recognizing many languages um, and producing works in many languages simultaneously in a non-hierarchical fashion. Um, I've also put at the bottom of the slide some of my earlier work for those who are interested in reading further on what I presented to you in just five minutes. Um, but in this primer, there's there's lots of amazing things to note. Um, here are my collaborators, here we are all together in drawing form. And you'll notice there's a lot of attention played in the primer to visuality. So another way we want to keep these complex relationalities in play is by thinking through multiple epistemes and forms of knowledge production. Images are important as anything else. Um, careful attention to 
the look and feel of an object, I think is really important to bringing in what I'll talk to you about now as the majority world, um, which is a term I've started to use in lieu of the global south in some situations. So some of the features of this project, which is a primer, it's a syllabus, is that we wanted to make sure, as I just said, we we're including lots of different um, kinds of knowledge. So we we do everything, we use everything from blog posts to books, and they're organized in terms of um, not hierarchically, not assuming that one is more important or valid than the other. It's multilingual. Let ling uh, lingual it comes <clears throat> with a Zotero library that is growing and additive you can add to it anyone can add to it and it's very collaborative there are a lot of collaborators on the project but now I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the term that we chose for the syllabus which is the majority world um, the term the majority world comes from a Bangladeshi photographer an extremely renowned photographer named Shahidul Alam who tells another story about visiting some friends in Dublin and their daughter, who was very young at the time, only five years old, when she saw Shahidul take money out of his pocket, she looked extremely puzzled and she said to him, and when he asked her why, she said to him, I didn't know that Bangla that she could have money. And so he came away from that experience very shaken and he thought to himself, there's something wrong with, with a world in which uh, Bangladesh as a place is so associated with poverty that someone can't even grasp that there are elites in that country. And so rather than continuing to use this term, the global South, which I've used in other writing, and I've always noticed that I have to sort of struggle against the way that the global South always wants to fall back into a territory that's strictly demarcated and named as an underdeveloped place, rather than continuing, the, continuing to struggle against the very limitations of the term itself, uh, Shahidul Alam, and then we took it up from him, um, coined this term majority world to challenge the West's rhetoric about complicity, the way that the rest, the West is complicit in things happening uh, outside what's considered the West. Um, and another thing that he wanted to do with this term, which I very much agree with, is to think through uh, how a community would define itself. A community would define itself as being with other people in community. Uh, and it also sort of flips the script on who gets to have a say, right? It puts people together who are outside traditional systems of power and suggests that they are in fact the majority in the world and they should have a say about how this world unfolds. So for all of those reasons, we began using this term. And I just want to end, I know I'm at my time limit by showing you a few pages from this project. Um, we were really keen to do two things in the project. One is to, to demonstrate a different way of building knowledge around AI. Um, and the other is to move away from deficit frameworks that frame certain places on the map as always being on the receiving end of AI harms and have not, having very almost nothing else to offer as if they were tabula rasa. But instead, what we wanted to do is to say that each of these places have their own epistemic traditions, their own ontological traditions through which we can think about the present, but also the future. Uh, so we paired, for instance, uh, maybe a, a more um, common idea of the war machine, how drone technologies work um, to distribute death, um, how AI might can be contributing to that, with something like anti-caste cultures to think about long traditions of pushing back against um, objectifying and oppressive forms of classification. What could we learn from that? Um, and I, I think this is where I'm going to end. I'm sorry I went a little longer than I wanted, but you know my main take home point is really to think about this, the worlds as relational, regardless of what terms you you want to use or deploy, um, and also to think about AI as I'm building here on Stuart Hall an episteme information that denotes emergent power, temporality, and knowledge that carries with it colonial after effects and also marks a shift in those relations. Thank you.
Thank you, Sarita. That was wonderful. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Tucson. Thank you, Haifa. And thank you, Sarita, for laying you know, the, the foundation for the discussion today uh, in such rich and engaging ways. Um, so I'm delighted to be, to be with you all today and participate in this conversation on global AI. Um, as Haifa mentioned, I'm based here at Stanford, but I direct the research at the Digital Civil Society Lab. We work on the challenges and opportunities that digital technologies present to civil society. Our remit is global in scope and interdisciplinary, and we routinely engage with civil society actors and digital rights activists. Um, these are individuals that come from different parts of the world and in particular from the African continent. They work on a broad range of technology related issues, including, for instance, biometric privacy, demographic, demographic data sets, content moderation, ethical AI, data trust, or the intersection of trade policy and digital policy. And that's just to name a few of the things that they're working on. And what I'll discuss today uh, really stems from my engagement with this global community. So the title of the event today is Reframing the Conversation. What does it mean to reframe the conversation? Think of it in really simple terms. There are many ways to reframe a conversation. You can start by changing who is part of the conversation and who is talking to who. You can change where the conversation is taking place and when. And the more you consider ways of reframing a conversation, the more you open new levers of action and avenues for interventions. And today I want to focus on, on two ways to reframe the conversation about global AI. And these are changing what we talk about and changing what language we use for the conversation. So let's start with changing what we talk about. I think <clears throat> dominant discourses about AI oscillate between discussing its potential and its risk. And in both cases, the emphasis is largely on AI's mid to long-term social impact. But for the activists and community organizers in Africa that we work with, the existing social consequences of AI systems have been at the top of their agenda. And I will take the case of content moderation. I'm glad Sarita also talked about it. The case of content moderation of AI powered social media platforms. And in particular, I want to bring um, to the discussion today two ongoing lawsuits in Kenya. The first lawsuit relates to the working conditions of content moderators. And this is a story that starts with Daniel Motong. Uh, some of you may have heard from him. He did the cover of uh, his story, made the cover of Time magazine um, a year ago. Um, and in 2019, uh, Daniel Motong, uh, a recent graduate from South Africa, accepted his first job. And that job was as a content moderator for Sama, a subcontractor used by Facebook to moderate content in various African languages. After getting the job, he was relocated to Kenya, signed a non-disclosure agreement, and was then revealed the type of content that he would be reviewing. For about $2 an hour, Daniel was subjected to uh, a non-stop non -stop stream of content that one of his colleagues described as mental torture. I'm not going to give more details here, but you can very well imagine um, what that work entails. When Daniel and some of his colleagues organized to unionize for better pay and better working conditions, including, for instance, mental health support, they were intimidated. Daniel was fired as he was filing out trade union papers, and the union never materialized. And today in Kenya, he's suing both Sama and Meta for union busting and for worker exploitation. The second lawsuit I'm afraid to say also concerns Meta. The plaintiffs argue that Facebook actively fueled ethnic violence in Ethiopia's civil war by amplifying hateful and dangerous content, then not moderating that content fast enough or sometimes even moderating it at all. One of the plaintiffs on this lawsuit is Abraham Amari. And he described how his father, a university professor in Ethiopia, was targeted on Facebook. Several posts sharing his name, picture, ethnicity, and false elections started circulating on the platform. A few weeks later, his dad was gunned down in front of his house in the middle of the day. Abraham says he asked Facebook several times to remove posts, this post about his father. He asked before and after his death. And his father was killed in November 2021 
And as of December 2022, some of these posts remained up on the platform. And today, Abraham, who's one of the plaintiffs, argues that these social media posts directly led to his father's killing. So how does this help us reframe the conversation about global AI? It brings into focus why the question of AI harms has been so important for activists in the global south or the majority world. I'm looking forward to you know, discussing our terminologies here. AI, AI systems already have social consequences, even in parts of the world often perceived or described as the lower end of digital connectivity. And in the case of content moderation, the consequences happen both downstream and upstream. Downstream, we have the social impact of under-moderated um, hateful content in uh, local languages. Upstream, we have exploitative work conditions for the humans in the loop, or the human as the loop, uh, as you said, Sarita, of content moderation. Importantly, um, these AI harms are being met with community engagement and pushback, as these two lawsuits show. And again, I think, sorry, this point about thinking about AI arms, not just about AI arms, but um, a broader, you know, what happens after all, the broader context around it is really important. Okay, another way to reframe the conversation is to change the language we use for the discussion. And here I want to share the example of a project that the lab uh, incubated very proudly. It's a project led by a Kenyan writer and activist named Nanjala Nebola. And back in 2019, the Kenyan government launched uh, plans for a centralized digital ID system called Huduma Namba. And Nanjala was among a group of activists who were concerned that the project would harm or exclude communities that did not understand tech or digital rights. But she describes how at the time she didn't really have the language to explain to non-English language speaking communities in Kenya what the implications of the initiatives were. Like other digital rights activists in the region and in other parts of the world, she was struggling because the pace of developments in tech was dramatically outpacing translation of key terms. And so as a fellow at the lab, she started a project called the Kiswahili Digital Rights Project. She held workshops with linguists and digital policy experts across East Africa to develop Kiswahili translations for keywords in digital rights and technology. Thanks to the project, for instance, there are now Kiswahili translations for data privacy, encryption, algorithm, and artificial intelligence. And Angela has been working to encourage the adoption of these translations in different contexts, including in schools and uh, among local news organizations um, who are publishing or you know, covering, doing news coverage in, in Kiswahili language. So the project really carries an important lesson here. People need contextualized knowledge and language about the systems that shape their lives. And in turn, this particular example, this will help build a future where Kiswahili language communities become key contributors to discussions in global technology or global AI. So we'll conclude with this thought. If the conversation about AI is to become meaningfully global, we'll need many other dictionaries like this one. And I'm glad to see also um, the publication that Sarita has been working on. Um, so I'll end on this and I'll uh, hand it over to Paola. Thank you, everyone. Hi, I think it's my turn. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having me here. I'm super honored and, and grateful for sharing this space with people that I admire and who inspires me and my work. And I will also take up the question on, on this panel, um, why we should reframe the conversation and what should we reframe? And, and first of all, um, I would be, like to begin like with, with the phrase global AI. Um, what does it mean for AI to be global? And I think, or, or we can of course uh, know, uh, we know that uh, it's global because AI is occupying our lives and our activities in, in visible and invisible ways. But that globality reflects uh, deep asymmetries because we participate differently in the AI ecosystem, depending on 
on who we are and when and where we are located. So in terms of, of governance, in terms of the capacity of producing technology, we are um, in different positions. So my work has been trying to um, reframe the conversation in, in terms of um, the historical origins of violence and also how social technical systems reproduce this violence and how AI in particular is um, changing the way in, we, uh, in, in which we understand violence in automated societies. So the first obvious thing is that AI as any technology is a matter of power, uh, but in our current historical moment is used as a geopolitical tool that allows the concentration of wealth, knowledge, and uh, social control. So this power concentration generates global asymmetries that contribute to the reproduction of oppressive systems, such as capitalism, colonialism, and the patriarchal order. So if we go back to history, technologies have long served humans and non-humans as tools to improve their capabilities to achieve things. However, the tools that we have created as humanity have shaped us and have shaped our social relations. So technologies are relational devices, as Sarita was mentioning, the idea of relationality is important because that's one of the things that's, that has been fractured in, in our current uh, value systems. So if we, um, again, if we go back to history, we can observe what tools were more prominent, who benefited from the development of those tools, who created them, and why and how. So we can think of tools like planes, ships, or spacecrafts, but we can also think of cars, washing machines, or air conditioners. So societies of privilege develop technologies of privilege. And as a result, in the history of humanity, certain technologies have been supported and privileged of, over others. And in context of precarity and scarcity like ours, like in places of the majority world, technologies have had a different shape and have served different purposes. So if we fast forward to our current times, I would say that AI is a technology of privilege. AI is a technology of the powerful. So what kind of power this technology enables? Um, so Technology has always served in the context of uh, racial capitalism as an extension of um, the intertwined systems of domination that uh, has, have been built on historical and contemporary violence against uh, racialized and gendered uh, bodies and specific territories. So social technical systems play a crucial role in reproducing social and epistemic violence to maintain the status quo. Uh, thus, imperial expansion in automated societies requires new tools to make capitalist accumulation more efficient. This means automating killing, amplifying surveillance, predicting risk and threats, producing a new class of invisible precarized workers, as Sarita was mentioning, and expanding the frontiers of extractivism of bodies and territories. So automated, automated societies is always accompanied by institutional transformation and also a reconfiguration of processes, norms, practices, relationships, discourses, and imaginaries. For this reason, I think we need to study and reframe the conversation systemic and structural violence in its reconfiguration as algorithmic violence. So this algorithmic violence is, a, is the use of force, power, on in, or influence mediated and habilitated by algorithmic assemblages that contribute to the reproduction of individual, collective, and societal forms of violence. And violence, again, is aimed at reinforcing dominant power structures at local and global scales. 
So the conceptualization of algorithmic violence takes into account that algorithmic assemblages perpetuate existing power imbalances with society, within societies, but also between societies. So for me, it's important to make this distinction explicit because algorithmic violence operates simultaneously in two directions, within societies as a form of internal control over racialized and precarious bodies, and across societies as a form of extraterritorial control over territories that are the source of data, natural resources, and precarious labor. As such, algorithmic violence produces physical, economic, epistemic, social, cultural, cognitive, emotional, and environmental harms, and is deepening and expanding local and global injustices. So the challenge is, as uh, Virginia Banks notes, is that these forms of violence are replicated and reinforced in ways that are many, in many, many times invisible or difficult to challenge. So what, what kind of violence and power is habilitated by these technologies? Um, first, as I was mentioned, the concentration of military power, the concentration of economic power. But for me, other forms of, of power are also important, uh, such as informational and epistemic power, because these forms of power uh, allows to exert social power over those who are not in the same position of privilege. So for example, uh, the US Department of Homeland Security relies heavily on cloud services, surveillance technology, and predictive analytics to keep immigrants under check. So um, in, this, in this way, these technologies are deployed to deepen those social asymmetries and knowledge gaps. So the use of these technologies, or the question that we should be asking is, who, who designs these technologies and for whom? Who is benefiting for, from the deployment of these technologies? What purposes, like in the long term, does automation and, and surveillance serve? So, and also if we are uh, working within critical frameworks, what notions of gender, race, class, justice, and future are reinforced. Um, so if we analyze AI, and, and I here, I'm, I'm always trying to um, uh, highlight the idea that um, AI is mainly uh, use, being used as a technology uh, of violence, because in, in our international debates or inter debates that are held in international settings, um, we never speak about, uh, for example, um, automatic weapons and how these weapons are designed to kill racialized and precarious bodies, uh, disposable bodies. And there is a very huge investment in the development of AI technologies because they are trying to meet this military uh, interest and, and to develop this military power. So um, if we understand that these algorithmic assemblages are a result of this arrangement of, of social constructs, social technical assemblages, uh, we have to reframe the discussion and we don't have to speak about uh, only the technical aspects of, of algorithmic assemblages. These are not just mathematical entities as, as Pierre uh, calls them. They are contextual, situated and shaped by social and cultural values and also produce harm uh, that is contextual, situated uh, and embodied. So um, I'm interested in refocusing the discussion on power and justice and violence in different spheres to highlight the need to differentiate the responsibilities of uh, different stakeholders. Um, because if we understand that these technologies are technologies that are developed by the powerful to, con to concentrate power, wealth, and social control, 
then we also need to understand that the responsibilities need to be differentiated. Um, and also it's important to understand the multidimensionality of harms that are resulting from the deployment of these technologies. So just to close this, this first um, intervention, um, I would say that despite fascination or hype, hegemonic AI is contributing to reinforce historical asymmetries and violence at scale. It's helping increase wealth and knowledge gap between nations and creating, as Farida mentions, global orders of classification and keeping certain bodies and territories under check. So hegemonic AI reproduces the logic of unlimited consumption, productivity, and efficiency associated with the capitalist logic of infinite accumulation and value extraction. And some AI makes balance more efficient. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was such a rich uh, presentation for, for all of you. And we have a few questions from the audience. Um, audience members, please send us questions through the Q&A feature. Um, so I'll start, you know, kind of high level, and this is an open question to really all the panelists, is uh, one of our guests say that they agree with um, your comments on the best is complicit, um, and the majority world should have more of a say in, in the design and the deployment of these technologies. And how exactly can we change this bird's eye view? Um, where do you think the change should, should come from? And I'll maybe start with Paula and then um, Chuson and Sarita, if you want to jump in. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um, how can we fight back? Of course, um, well, I... I began saying that I'm interested in how violence is being reconfigured in automated societies. But in the history of struggles, um, people have always fought back. And uh, we have to be, um, yeah, we have to listen and we have to learn from the people that have been struggling for centuries. So I think that the solutions, there are many solutions that, uh, Sen was mentioning there are many solutions and the solutions are out there. The problem is that we don't want to see uh, those solutions and also that it's hard for us to, um, yeah, to change the way in which we live, despite we know that the way in which we live and the way in which technologies are developed is not sustainable. So the system in which we live is not sustainable. So how can we organize politically to, um, to make this world um, more a world uh, devoted to satisfy the needs of the majority and not of the powerful? And for me, uh, I'm, I think I'm fortunate because I have seen and I'm always uh, close to the experience of people that um, show me that this is possible in, in many ways. I will later, maybe if I have time, uh, speak about a project that we're developing. And I see that it's very hard to develop technologies within a different framework <clears throat> that challenges power. But I think that uh, we're trying to do it. And, and that's very, for me, at least, it's it's a way of having hope that if we organize and politically organize, um, we can fight back. Usan, Sarita, do you have any comments to add to that? Uh, you know, I'll just add briefly, um, you know, seeing this conversation already um, today at HAI happening, is a step, but you know we're talking about reframing the conversation, um, and that means having these efforts being sustained. You know, um, as a scholar of you know international affairs, I've always found that you know international issues in many research areas are like you know chapter nine in an edited volume, and so I think you know there's there's a commitment from um, key. Um, institutions shaping the discourse around AI to really um, not just, uh, you know, 
listen to this comment but really hear it and and that comes with a commitment to um a sustained commitment to keep on bringing um voices that that bring these different different perspectives and that's also you know the case if you think about you know key mediators of the discourse around ai you know um centers um are one of them but you know news organizations are another and um you know the ways in which uh, journalists reporting on ai and um really pushing for you know reporting that takes seriously not just you know what's happening elsewhere but the transnational connection between you know what's happening in the us and what's happening in india or kenya um that is really key um and these are like you know commitments that that um that need to be made where money is in some ways um what the, the power to enact that because the energy from people who are both either confronting the AI harms or even inventing um, new ways to respond to these challenges are out there, um, but are powered, you know, uh, just in terms of capital. So I think, um, you know, um, at a very big picture level, uh, that needs to be, uh, you know, longstanding commitment. Um, yeah. Sarita, do you want to add anything? Um, I mean, I, I I really agree with both both of what Paola and Toussaint said. I would maybe just add that this is not a trivial question. Um, at this moment, I think <clears throat> the way I, I start thinking about fighting back is to be in community with others, um, but also when in community to always ask the question of who isn't yet in the room. I think that's a very, very key question to ask. And there's a book I can recommend that I recommend all the time now called Elite Capture, which I think is very good for people who are working in university spaces or centers. Um, and then the other question to ask is um, how is a very old question, you know, given one subject position, whatever it is, how can you use that subject? subject position to redirect the conversation, resources, um, forms of solidarity. So that's sort of the my starting point. And I would agree very much that there are projects happening in many places that that uh, that you can join or become a part of. But that the question of co-optation, I think, is very real. Um, how we talk about those projects, how we can support them without at the same time making them vulnerable to surveillance, violence, and capture. I think that's a really important question to keep asking. Yeah, thank you so much for your um, comments. And you know, this event is happening here at Stanford. So I really appreciate that we're thinking here about the responsibility and the um, historical nature of um, you know, resource uh, kind of extraction and the limitations there. And I'm curious in your work as you, you know, push this forward and bring really nuanced approaches to developing knowledge. Uh, Sarita, for example, the AI primer uh, does a really good job of not just having books and journal articles, but podcasts and more accessible resources, um, you know, in different communities um, so that they can be uh, received more. Um, what are also some of the tensions or challenges that you encounter, you know, in your spaces sitting here in the global north as you try to push forward uh, the contextualization narrative? Um, I know Data and Society also produced um, an AI uh, parable series workshop with taking a storytelling approach, which is also really great when thinking of, uh, you know, minority communities um, with minority languages. So I'm curious, what are the tensions you encounter in educating those in the global north on this important of uh, contextualization? Oh, that's a, that's a, I thought that's a great question. Um, so I think... Maybe I can start off and then pass it over to, to San Paula. But one of the biggest tensions I find is um, <clears throat> the desire in certain spaces to have a very simple, clear story of victimhood and then overcoming a reclamation. And resisting that has become extremely important to me because something that Paula said in her comments, that we have to get a handle on both the trans-regional, transnational forms of violence that are enacted through AI systems, but also the local ones. I think that's very, very clear. So one of the biggest contradictions I find in my work thinking about South Asia is thinking about a nation state like India as both um, 
a place in which there is tremendous amounts of labor exploitation for AI systems elsewhere. That itself has a very long history that we can think of through the history of indenture. But at the same time, there is a very strong majoritarian um, impulse that also wants to use surveillance apparatus and forms of violence against, uh, against communities. And that to me is a huge tension, um, trying to keep those in balance and trying to tell a narrative that doesn't either collapse into a story of redemption or one of the banality of evil. I think that's really a tough one. Yeah. Uh, Tucson, Paula, do you have any comments to add to that? Paula, no. I see there are also many questions in the chat. Um, no, I, you know, thanks for sharing that, Sarita, Sarita um, you know, so openly. Yeah, um, so I have a question in the chat. Uh, we possibly can't leave today without asking this. this is a difficult one, but uh, one of our guests is asking that when most AI is being built by large tech companies, um, with incentives to make or save money, what are the mechanisms to change those incentives? Uh, policy seems really behind, um, and even India just said it would not regulate anything in the immediate future. So how do we push back against or change these incentives? Not using the technology doesn't seem to be an option anymore. So Tucson, maybe I'll start this one with you. I mean, you know, um, I think regulation is, you know, not an option. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, I appreciate how the question is framed, and obviously, you know, everyone here on this call is very well aware of, you know, the lag that always exists between the technology and its regulation. Um, but I think um, that's that's you know that's the horizon uh, that we should be looking at. Now, with that being said, that doesn't mean that all the sort of um, community um, engagement, especially in its global perspective. Um, need to be only focused on on this and you know i think what paola and um and sarita are doing are such good examples of how you bring people in um into um into this conversation into their complexities into um surfacing uh for people why you know we need to have a broad-based um, engagement around these issues and so um i think um, you know, that that would be um, how I see it. And, um, you know, regulation being part of it, um, popular um, community engagement in transnational perspectives too. Um, I'm curious to hear what the other, how they're seeing this. Um, maybe, maybe I can, Paula, do you want to, or I'll, I'll just say a few words and combine it maybe with what, well, and Andrew's question about, uh, where to start to push things into local scales. I mean, clearly there have been ongoing efforts from employees within the biggest tech companies to put pressure on them. And so it seems just, just talking with those activists, what, what works, and of course, this is a battleground. I think we have to recognize everything we're talking about as an ongoing battleground. What seems to work is, a, is this three, tripartite combination of internal pressure that tries to hold companies accountable to what they say they're trying to do in the world. Um, media, clearly pressure, whistleblowing, and regulation. Those seem to be the levers. And of course, the internal pressure comes through unionization. So I think we have to recognize this uh, whole field is a battleground that's also part of uh, a workers movement. And then to bring in Andrew's question, pushing to the local, there are, there are lots of um, small, maybe they'll be temporary. Again, this is a, a, a dialectics at a standstill in a, a sense. It's a ongoing set of pressures that, that maybe fail and then get brought up again. There are efforts uh, all over the place to work to shift not the technology uh, necessarily, but the context in which the technology unfolds, which necessarily changes the technology. So in New York yesterday, I just went to an amazing presentation about co-ops. Co-ops need supply chains. Uh, they need accountants. They, uh, they, they, uh, the, the um, taxi drivers co-op built an app 
It's not Uber and it's not Lyft. It's their own app. But um, it's hard work. It's underfunded, as we've been saying. It needs more support. And um, it comes with a different history and therefore a different temporality. It, it doesn't do that efficiency thing uh, that Paolo was talking about. It does something else. It creates a different kind of social formation. And so I think to answer that question of where to start is to look at um, alternatives. Maybe it's a solidarity economy and the businesses involved in that. And, to, and it's maybe mesh networks. It's, it's hard to say from the outside what it will look like because it's not actually a technological solution. It's the solution that changes the context in which a technology emerges and changes the answer to the question of who this technology is for. Thank you so much, um, Sarita, Toussaint, and Paula for really, uh, you know, reframing that conversation. I think that was the perfect start um, to our first panel. And, you know, our next panel, we'll talk about designing for global languages, and we'll get into that space a little bit to hear from folks who are uh, working in this space. Uh, we are now up for time for this panel, although we have many questions coming through the chat. And I think that some of the resources that were shared here today, we'll drop them into the chat so people can look at the primer and other things that were shared. Um, for the audience members, uh, we will be taking a brief five minute break before we come back uh, for the next panel. And again, I just want to thank all of our panelists today for a really strong panel. I think all of us will be doing a lot of reading tonight. Um, and as you highlighted that this work is happening around the world, it's not that it's not happening, but it's a question of um, elevating those voices and making sure that we're taking a moment to reframe before we think about uh, the problems and the solutions. Thank you so much. And uh, we will take a brief five minute break before panel two right now. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for those who've joined um, the previous session. We're really excited today to continue the conversation on global AI. Um, we're particularly thrilled to have our second session of today uh, focused on global languages. And the title for today's session is Designing for Global Languages. And to bring us into this conversation, we have truly what I think is such an amazing, inspiring, and transformative panel here today. Uh, these are folks that are really pushing the frontier of technology at this intersection between language and artificial intelligence, but one that is embedded with equity and focused on community. And so to bring us into this conversation, we have three wonderful panelists that you see here, and I will be uh, introducing them. We'll also proceed to a moderated Q&A session, and then we'll bring in the audience. So please continue to submit those questions in the Q&A below. I'm the moderator for today, and my name is Rain Sullivan. I'm a climate uh, AI fellow here at High, and at Stanford, I'm also an advisor to our Office of Sustainability. Um, I work on research at our Reg Lab here at Stanford Law School, and I'm also a JD candidate um, at the law school. And our first panelist today is Peter Lucas Jones. Now, Peter Lucas Te Aupori Nai Takoto Nakati. Kahu is the chief executive officer of Tehiku Media. He's also the chairman of Te Fakaruru Hau o Na Reo Irirangi Maori, the EV radio network, and also the chairman of Te Runanga Nui o Te Aupori. He is also the Kai Tiaki of EV radio data and negotiates the responsibility of protecting data while also leading the development of natural language processing tools for Te Reo Māori. Peter Lucas has 20 years of experience working with Kaumatua to record and provide access to Reo A EV and Korero Tuku Iho. This has informed the development of Kai Tian, Tiai Tikanda, Tanga uh, Ekalamai, uh, data license of Tehiku Media. Thank you so much for joining us, Peter. We're thrilled to have you. And next, we have Stanford's own Monica Lam. Now, Dr. Monica Lam has been a professor of computer science at Stanford University since 1988. She is also the faculty director of the Stanford Open Virtual Assistant Laboratory. And Professor Lam is also a member of the National Academy of Engineering and an ACM fellow. Her research interests are in deep learning, natural language, and programming languages. And her research on natural language processing led to the creation of the very first conversational virtual assistant 
based on deep learning, which received Popular Science's Best of What's New Award and secured in 2019. And we'll hear more about that later today. And finally, our last panelist is Zirak Ahmed. Zirak Ahmed is a designer, engineer, and a writer from Lahore, Pakistan. Ahmed is a principal user experience design lead at Amazon, and he also designs Urdu technology under Matanzas, um, where he also curates and writes about Pakistani pop music on Hamnawa. Ahmed has worked on uh, search for Microsoft, um, educational games, healthcare technology, and he also holds a master's in design engineering with distinction from the Harvard Graduate School of Design and the Harvard John A. Paulson School of Engineering and applied scientists. He also has a bachelor's of science and engineering, magna cum laude in computer science and public policy from Princeton. He was also part of a laptop orchestra and has taught design and computer science. Welcome everyone and really looking forward to a wonderful conversation. And with that, let's have a, a 10 minute presentation with Peter followed by Monica and then Zirak and then we'll get into questions. Peter, if you'd like to start. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a great opportunity to tell our story. And um, I just wanted to start out by saying that our, uh, our, our kaupapa or the foundation of our movement is really based on where we came from. And so um, I'm the CEO of Te Reo Irirangi o Te Hiku o Te Ika, more popularly known as Te Hiku Media. And we were formed in 1919. And uh, we are a tribal radio station in our roots. And there are 21 uh, tribal radio stations within New Zealand. And so our station is associated with Ngati Kuri, Te Aupauri, Ngai Takoto, Te Rarawa, and Ngati Kahu. And those are the five most northern tribes in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And as we know, uh, indigenous peoples throughout the world uh, have sub been subjected to some terrible, terrible stories of colonization. And our story um, also features a document that is called Te Tiriti o Waitangi, otherwise known as the Treaty of Waitangi. And so the Te Reo Māori claim or the Māori language claim was uh, submitted and, and, and um, considered in and around that time of 1985 and is regarded as Y11 or the 11th claim that was made through the Waitangi Tribunal process. Other claims were uh, associated with uh, frequencies, radio frequencies and, and our ability um, to broadcast was very much associated with wanting to communicate in our own languages. Uh, it's also important to mention Y262 or the flora and fauna claim where our language also features in there as a taonga or a very important part of our heritage. Uh, I mentioned this because uh, cultural knowledge and intellectual property uh, uh, with regard to all Māori knowledge was very much the basis of that claim. And we think back, we think back to where we came from and our elders, our parents, our grandparents, they went through a process of white assimilation and that really uh, included having the language beaten out of their mouths. And so when we draw on the context, it gave rise to our efforts to record as much of our history in our language with those uh, people from our tribal groups that uh, were native speakers, but not just native speakers that lived native lives. Um, and so that was a big part of our, our, our journey recording that language from those speakers, uh, from those communities, but not just recording it, doing it with them and as members of the community. And so we've been doing that for 30 years now, but what we found is that 
we wanted to digitize a huge analog collection. And with that came new responsibilities because when things are analog, of course, you can just pick them up and put something somewhere in a box and it's safe. But when you digitize all that information and you put it uh, into platforms, uh, along with that comes a whole lot of new responsibilities. And we take those responsibilities seriously, but we had to make some movements to actually change the way we were doing things if we were in fact going to reach uh, the 86% of our members of our tribe that do not live in our tribal areas that are citizens of the world and to connect people in what we were calling a big marae in the sky. Um, and that really gave rise to our work uh, that was in the natural language processing area. We developed a, a very large corpus for Te Reo Māori anyway, that was tagged and labelled for the purpose of natural language processing. And we wanted that to be led by our people for our people. And the reason for that is our work and every action um, that we do is incrementally associated with liberation in the sense that digital real estate uh, could very much reflect the story of our real lives, which was land loss, cultural decline, and of course, uh, the language, as I mentioned, being beaten out of the mouths of many, many families. And so we wanted to lead that, and so we did. Um, and we led the development of the first Māori language speech technology that I'm aware of that, uh, that, that managed to reach a 10% error rate in, in, our real, in our language, which is an Eastern Polynesian language. Moving on from there, we started to develop some synthetic voices, looking at how we could assist our nonverbal um, uh, uh, community members and other people that were struggling. But as we looked at that work we were going to do, we mm -hmm. always took the opportunity to look back. And we have a proverb, and it says, e hoki whakamuri. So the past very much informs the way that we work into the future, and particularly because we had come from a place of have not. And so there's a lot of new stuff happening. Um, but one of the important things for us is that we need to own our digital assets. Um, and we want to invest in, in those assets in a way that creates jobs for our people because everything's connected. And um, I just wanna leave it there for now before I go on too long, but that whole theme of everything is connected and that our work is about liberation more than it is about technology is, is really a theme that, that works through our our thinking all the time and it's about maintaining sovereignty of data creating those opportunities for our people um, while making indigenous language more ubiquitous but promoting language and culture from our worldview because if we give companies access to our data which i'm sure they're already harvesting anyway they could and will sell a language back to the very people that had it beaten out of their mouths. And so that's where we're thinking of um, when we think about liberation and it's leading that from our place and in our space. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. We'll return to a lot of this conversation about liberalization uh, and owning the data. Um, and now I want to turn it to Monica to give her 10 minute presentation. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to this audience. And um, I want to start by saying that I got into AI only about eight years ago. And the reason is really um, motivated by the fact that I was very, very concerned about how the technology has been affecting the community. Uh, about this, you know, the society, and and it is absolutely 
uh, it, I'm very, very embarrassed, frankly, to see how technology is used by some of these companies, such as Facebook, that centralizes all the private information and exploit it for their um, for. Uh, you know, they they are bringing a value, but at the same time, they have turned into a platform that um, violate, you know, that that cause so much harm to the society, as we heard about it this uh, earlier in the first panel. And as a technologist, I felt like we really have to worry about, you know, have to take that into consideration. And I see that we, you know, the AI, the new technology is coming up, and I want to make sure that when that technology, as that technology develops, we look at ways to make sure it is better for the, for the community. And of course, the biggest things in the recent years is natural language with the introduction of the large language models, which is like the GPT-3, chat GPT and so forth. And the power of language is, is uh, it, you know, the, what it can do is amazing. And, and natural language is very, very powerful. It has, uh, as we talked about some of the possible you know, negative um, uses of technology, I want to also emphasize the positive uses of technology. Natural language is the human interface. You know, finally, we are talking about computers being able to use the natural language interface to talk to, you know, to, to interact with, um, with people. And it has a lot of positive advantages. So for example, um, if you just look at what happens in during the pandemic, there are a lot of people, for example, the Hispanics who are not getting their vaccination, um, they are maybe less savvy uh, with the technology. And the if, and if you have the natural language um, capability, it is very easy for them to just arrange vaccination and stuff like that for themselves without getting help with uh, from other people to get on the internet. Okay, so the concept is that the language can reach everybody is really important. There is another project that is done by um, people in our department, Musa Dumbuya and um, Chris Peach. And what they did was that they found in, um, in Africa, there are people who are, you know, they are, they, they are illiterate. I mean, they not only do they just speak their native language, they're illiterate. And they cannot even Oh, sorry, they're non-literate. It is not a, a language that has a written representation even. And they could not even use a mobile phone easily because they cannot look up the phone numbers of their friends, okay? Because they cannot understand the, cannot understand, they cannot read the names of the, of the um, address book. Um, but with natural language, they can just say to the phone, um, I want to, you know, call so and so and so forth. So, so natural language is very, very important to make technology accessible to everybody. And incidentally, the group was able to um, put in the natural language capabilities for, for example, with um, calling people and so forth by using radio transcripts. Okay, and I thought that was very interesting as we are talking about, uh, you know, with what Peter was, Peter Lucas is talking about. I mean, that is the um, information they use to make it possible for them to um, create technology for those African languages. So, um, as we are deploying natural language, we are again, we're, I, I'm very much um, worried again about having the technology being um, only available to the largest companies. So if you look at, for example, virtual assistants, um, Alexa, um, Google, they were actually Alexa pretty much has um, uh, the, the, the majority of the market share. And if you look at virtual assistants, it's a very powerful, con it's a very powerful product by offering people the ability to talk to your computers via voice, um, they become kind of like a, a gateway because now you can talk to many different um, services, IOTs using voice, um, and then you're just dealing with a single entity, which is the assistant. 
and they have to control over the market because you know it's a proprietary system and if you want to be part of the system you have to live with by their rules if you're a competitor it is not so great <laughs> and um so there is a cause there, there's an issue with the market access but more concerning is that it also has a lot of access to personal information if you are interacting with a bank you know you will have to park your credentials with Alexa and the IoT devices if you want to talk to them the information is actually shipped up to the cloud and so there's a, just a lot of privacy issues um, that come up with the concept of a virtual assistant it's a very convenient piece of software but at the same time the power of what it can do is um, is very worrisome. So, so for the last eight years, what I have been doing is to try to democratize the technology, because the technology is very expensive. If you look at Alexa, they have over ten thousand employees. Okay, and at the same time, you know the product is still um, not as good as it could be, um, and the reason is that. AI has been, um, is, is very labor intensive. You need a lot of labeling. This is what also was discussed in the first panel. And um, how do we democratize it? So our research group um, looked at a different way of getting this data, this, this, the labeled data, and that was by synthesizing most of this data. And it is possible in a sense when it comes to interacting with devices because um, they are limited in what it can say. So we have done a lot of work to automatically synthesize it. And as a result, it is possible for our small team of PhD students um, and, uh, you know, and some undergraduate students to create a, a pilot of a virtual assistant that is conversational. It is not just single commands. And at the same time, it also protects privacy. And the way we protect privacy is that we actually, all the code is open source and you can run locally on your own device. And um, in our demo, I mean, in our pilot, the um, natural language processing is done in the cloud. Um, but recently our, my, our colleague, Tatsuyo Hashimoto, has been working on a new language model that is small enough that it can even fit on a local device on a Raspberry Pi and so forth. So there are a lot of technologists like us who are really looking at ways in which we can democratize the technology and make it possible for us to have privacy. Um, I also want to talk about another project that we have started about a year ago. And that is that, you know, with our team, we were doing all the work in English, right? Um, and so what we have started is a multinational effort to try to see how we can um, take the technology, take the work we are doing in English and have it work for other languages without a lot of manual labor. In the same way, if you make it cheaper, then it is possible for us to get into the lower resource languages. And um, this project was done with, it, it actually started with a database in China by a group in the uh, Tianjin University. They have a Chinese data set of language, of, of conversations, and they annotated to give it the meaning. You know, it's like, this is what I say, and this is what I mean, and this is how you can retrieve the information from databases to answer the question. It is um, very difficult to get that kind of labeling. And so they have done it for Chinese. So we got their, uh, so they worked on doing the translation into English. And we worked with other groups. We have a group from France. We've got a group from India. Um, it is, um, the combination of Microsoft and the IIIT University. Uh, France is the CAA, CEA group. And we also have a group in um, Korea. And um, that was Jiwan uh, So's project. And so the idea here is to try a few different languages. And our focus is actually build the tools. The, if we can build the tools, so and then we try it on these with uh, with these languages, 
that um, we can find researchers to work with. Once we get the tools working, we can make it available so other people can use the tools to work on, to, 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 to transfer it to other languages and to do it by people who are not AI savvy. So that's the project that it's ongoing and um, we are almost ready with that. Uh, we learned a whole lot in creating those tools because this was actually, it's a, the tools use a combination of machine language translation as well as um, some small amount of manual effort. So this is our ways of trying to get the, make this technology more available to uh, low resource language speakers. Well, thank you. Um, and um, I'm happy to take questions later. Thank you, Monica, for your thoughts and experiences with the Opal Open Virtual Assistance Lab. Sirak, would love to turn it to you to hear your thoughts um, and to have more of an insight of some of the work that you've been up to and how it relates to uh, the presentations that we've just heard from. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to share some slides if that's okay. Um, Okay, so what I want to walk you through is uh, this project called Matan Saz, uh, which is uh, our work to uh, better represent the Urdu language uh, on the modern internet. Um, the Urdu language is spoken by about 100 million speakers in South Asia, mostly across Pakistan and India. In Pakistan, it's a lingua franca, and in India, it's also used as an official language. Um, while it's mutually intelligible with Hindi, um, in the software world, they've largely been considered two separate languages, even though they have a shared history. Um, Urdu uses the Arabic script, which will become uh, important in the next couple of slides. Um, what I like showing people is the sort of video of uh, modern Lahore. And if you kind of go across it, you'll see like billboards, advertisements, uh, everything is written either in English or in Urdu transliterated in the Latin script, um, rather than using the Arabic script. Uh, this is really common, even if you text the government and or receive text from government services, they're often written in Arabic script. And the question is, why is it that a country that is uh, in a language uh, that is so widely spoken and with a population that doesn't really speak English, why are we uh, having to resort to another script? or another language. We find this goes into really extreme scenarios as well. Uh, this is a news story from a few years ago, but this sort of news story appears quite often. Uh, the suggestion is that we should turn the uh, language uh, of um, instruction in uh, primary schools across the country into a hybrid of English and Urdu, where the idea is that we use English for technical vocabulary and Urdu for conversational vocabulary. Um, there's an underlying assumption here that Urdu cannot be used for modern technical vocabulary, for science and technology. Um, and the question is, why is this happening? Why is this language failing to keep up? Um, and my uh, my theory or my uh, argument is that this is largely technological and there's a number of technological compromises that have happened that have uh, prevented uh, modern technology from being represented in the Urdu language to the point where uh, people who speak Urdu now believe that they cannot operate computers or uh, modern technology using their own language and much must resort to English. So my question is, if our goal is to enable Urdu applications, what can we start? What infrastructure can we build? Um, and I sort of do this sort of layer cake diagram. And for me, I started with keyboards as a way of intervening. And part of the reason I chose keyboards was because it allowed us to create all of these infrastructure layers uh, that were intermediate that we could share with other technologies, such as language models um, and dictionaries. It's interesting when you interview people about Urdu keyboards, users, uh, which is that top quote here, just blame themselves. Uh, they're like, it's not bad, but maybe I should have been able to learn a little bit more. Uh, perhaps it's just my memory. Um, and so our customers are blaming themselves. But when you talk to technologists, uh, their quote is from the bottom, which is, well, we've solved this problem. So I don't really understand why we should do any better here. Um, and for me, this is kind of one-on-one for designers to come in and, and think of something better and lower the barrier to entry. The good thing is that there's tens of millions of people that are coming online for the first time uh, using smartphones and they have no technological baggage. They're not attached to the previous ways of doing things. And so they can really experiment with this kind of new hardware that is very capable, has touch screens, uh, new, uh, uh, new pro like good processors. And so we can really experiment with new UIs. And so what we've been able to do is to take 
what is commonly kind of an alphabetical based keyboard layout, which is on the right, which is quite common. And you'll see various layouts of this, but it has about 39 letters in the Urdu keyboard. And we've been able to convert it into a shape based uh, keyboard on the left for the Arabic script. And so we've been able to compress what was a 29 or 39 letter keyboard into a 21 letter keyboard. So nearly half the keys as before. So for people that have never typed or for whom uh, like 40 letters is just too hard to think about and a keyboard, we've been able to compress it. We do this by uh, making use of the natural layers in the Arabic script. So the Arabic script has letters that share lots of shapes. Um, then we add dots uh, and other diacritics to indicate uh, what consonant they are and uh, what, what vowelization they might have. And so when we put that together, we come up with uh, a keyboard where as you type, you just select the basic shapes of the letters and the dots are added automatically. Um, and this uh, drastically compresses uh, the amount of cognitive load that you need to operate the keyboard, um, as well as making the keys easier to hit and more reliable to hit and lowers the barrier for entry for people to start typing. Now, this only works if you have good underlying uh, data sets and, and language models. Um, and so as the other two panelists have talked about, this is a big challenge for us as well. Um, the reason this was the challenge is the way that we do uh, language models generally is that you'll just scrape a lot of published texts, identify patterns, and then use that to make predictions and corrections. It's pretty simple. The issue is that nearly the entirety of Urdu text is riddled with errors. This is a tweet from our former prime minister, and I uh, highlight this not to sort of uh, specifically call him out, but most journalists, most politicians, all uh, official documentation is riddled with textual errors. And what's happening in this one, um, I'll, I'll highlight it in a bit more uh, detail, is I've, I've taken some text and put it in monospace font so you can see kind of what's happening. In modern printed Urdu text, it's really common for spaces to just be eaten up or put in arbitrarily. Um, and the reason that's happening is because uh, Urdu speakers are so uh, enamored by the aesthetic appearance of their text um, and have so little access to spell check that they use spaces as a way of aesthetically spacing out their text as opposed to integrating word boundaries. Um, and what that means for us is every time we scrape text, we can never tell when one word ends and another word begins. For us to be able to accurately predict text, we have to fix dozens of errors in every piece of text that we find. Um, and in fact, this is not the only issue that we run into. Um, if we take kind of any source of text that we hand, and these are actual sources of text that we use for our data set, we'll find that there's you know, uh, a journal that's using English bibliographies, uh, another journal that is quoting text from Arabic, um, or a newspaper that's just interspersing English text or English numerals right in the middle of Urdu text. So we have this kind of mixture and melange of uh, languages as we write, and this is a result of our kind of colonial past as well as the kind of shared cultural heritage of the reason, uh, region. And so to make this data set actually usable, we decided to structure and create an open source corpus. And so what we did was that we individually attributed every document we were citing because we wanted to be auditable and we wanted to be open source so that people can select what data they want in their own language models, where it's from, who's written it, what year it's from. And then we started adding semantic markup as to what was actually being said, headings, block quotes, and so forth, and started marking out languages that were not in Urdu, which is really common in Urdu text. Um, this takes kind of an XML structure uh, that's fairly simple and uh, easy for us to read as we're structuring it. Um, doing this process, we fixed hundreds of thousands of errors uh, in about 6 million words of text. And the way we've done that is we look for you know common things like spacing, uh, typos, word breaking issues. Um, and we have this sort of multi-step correction process that we uh, built with researchers from across the world. Um, we built some automation tools to convert text from kind of old archaic word processing formats. We use regular expression, but then we do a lot of manual XML tagging. We do a man lots of manual demarcation in other languages. And then when we're unable to look for typos just by eye, we start looking for signals that indicate a typo might have occurred, like diacritics that are attached to a space instead of a letter, or single letters that are kind of floating around unconnected to each word. Um, and after we add kind of a, a further review and metadata, that's when we kind of publish it uh, to our open source library. And so we've been able to publish not just um, uh, the open source data set, but also just kind of commonly run n-grams, word frequencies, and so forth, so that people can go in, and even if they don't want to run through the whole corpus themselves, can get a quick um, uh, a, a quick new program uh, based on our data set, uh, ready to go. And this work is is available on our website, madansas.net, both the keyboard and the data set, and we've been able to take a lot of infrastructure and put it out. Um, and our hope is that some of this work 
will enable new kinds of technology. But um, I'm hoping this also indicates um, uh, some of the issues that uh, serve uh, or, or plague underserved languages um, on the internet, what we have to do and what the challenges we need to go through uh, to better represent them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zirak, for an amazing overview of your project, and I can't wait to return to it in the Q&A session. Um, right now, we're going to get into about a 10-minute moderated Q&A, and then audience, please, again, um, feel free to jump in during uh, the succeeding portion in the Q&A, so continue to put in your chats questions. Um, Peter, I want to return to you, and you brought up a lot of compelling points about data sovereignty and the importance of indigenous communities owning that technology, but also being the chief architects and designing and implementing that. Um, I know there's been a lot of uh, controversy that's been written about. You've commented on OpenAI's whisper speech to recognition. Um, and I know it uses some Te Reo Maori. Could you give more insight into uh, why this issue is so important and some sort of key insights and, and thoughts that you have on this subject of data sovereignty and community ownership from an indigenous perspective. Oh, kia ora. Um, I guess one of the really important things that drives us is empowering Maori innovators and developers and empowering the leadership of the community and projects that we are seeing are having uh, better results in the community than in institutions. But we're also mindful of the role of corporations and we're mindful of the role of international corporations and how that can impact or stymie our own development. And history has a strange way of repeating itself. And so when we think about our history and we think about our place in the world now, um, we are often thinking about how do we improve our situation. So we take seriously the role of strategically partnering with um, other experts um, by growing our team through focusing on capability, but looking at that to help uh, to help carve out a pathway for a digital future for Te Reo Māori. And we use that by leveraging our, our tagged and labeled data set that we've spent more than 30 years of developing because sitting alongside that is the quality of the language. Um, and when we think about the role of our colonization and diminishing uh, so many aspects of our language and culture, we have to think about how do we maintain the integrity and one example about that is pronunciation. So more recently, we've developed a pronunciation model. And the pronunciation model is about restoring native sound. Um, and whilst we have a very uh, ambitious goal in New Zealand to have 1 million Maori language speakers by 2040, how do we maintain the integrity and the quality of the language. And I think that's by having people that love and care about the integrity leading the project. Pronunciation is a basic quality of Maori language learning. Um, and many of our words sound similar. And one word can have more than several meanings depending on the context of its use. And so when we think about that, poor pronunciation obscures communication and can prevent whatever it is that someone is intending to communicate um, intelligibly being known by the person that's being spoken to or listened, uh, listening to that, 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 those words or those sentences. So vocabulary comprehension and vocabulary production are two separate banks that we're mindful of as broadcasters. And so when we think about those words and when they're in the mind of a speaker, um, native as well as second language, pronunciation is such an important feature. And so when we think about voice synthesis and when we think about um, speech to text, we're mindful of the role of our organizations like ourselves 
um, second language speakers and native Maori language speakers and the intimate knowledge that they bring to the equation. And so for us, sitting alongside that is also language and culture and how that is so important when we think about the well-being of our families and if we look at the results uh, with our students we have many students in the mainstream schools and we have students in the total immersion native schools and these schools have a much higher success rate um, and much of that is because of their understanding of Māori data. And so if we look at other kaupapa or other movements like the star navigation movement, we look at the, um, the carving of, of, of canoes and the restoration of data in that space. Likewise, we want to make sure that our data is not weaponized against us and our efforts to restore the language to the mouths of our families. That's one example. But also, it's important for us to note that these are signals. These are features of the standards of living that we know we can play a role in improving. Um, and I think that Monica's spoken already uh, and, and, and Zirak has already spoken already to the need to democratize these things and get them into the hands of the people that need them most of all. But I think there's also a way to do that. And Zirak has already raised to our attention the need to have quality assurance. And likewise, in our project, which is teaching computers how to speak Māori, we want to make sure that we're not doing harm to the language. But we are, in fact, in our movement, producing results that um, catapult us into the future without diminishing the integrity of the and the quality of the language. Because our language, of course, has had many orthographic styles. And as we go through the tagging and labeling of our data, we too find that we need to sometimes consider having multiple models running at once because we also speak bilingually. And so when we speak bilingually, we are code switching. So these are some of the things that we want to look at um, now and into the future. But the reason for it is because it has been taken away from us. And earlier we heard about the struggle and the fight and we are fighting to lead the projects that we believe should be led by our people. That is not to say that we don't think others have a space or a place in that, uh, 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 in, uh, in those projects. We absolutely do. But it's about the strategic relationships and the way that we grow leadership in, in the whole space of data sovereignty from a Māori perspective. Thank you, Peter, for that. Now, Monica and Zirak, I want to bring you guys into this either with reactions or also to sort of expand on your own work as it touches upon a lot of these common threads that we see. Uh, Monica, I guess just sort of starting with you, um, you talked a little about at the end, you know, partnerships with Tianjin University and the internalization of um, your work at the Open Virtual Systems Lab. Could you talk a little bit more about that and the kind of considerations and approaches um, that you and your team are implementing as you're building you know, what you've described as sort of the one-stop shop um, in terms of the Genie Toolkit uh, for the world? Um, so the we believe that it is really important to make it possible for non-AI experts to participate in um, getting more languages um, uh, to be understood by the computers. And um, we, in this, in the first round, we are just picking um, friend, I mean, colleagues that are in, that speak different languages because you just have to have native speakers and um, that are savvy technically um, and also represent some interesting languages. So for example, with the um, folks in India, 
you know, in India, they always are mixing Hindi. Well, there are many, many languages to begin with, but most of them know Hindi and in, in a lot of them know Hindi and English. And as a matter of fact, they're always switching between English and Hindi. So in our data set, it actually includes this pure Hindi version as well as mixed code English and Hindi. So we can learn what it means to have code switch uh, languages. Um, and um, we also think that, you know, we, if we have the Chinese, English, French, Hindi, uh, these are the languages that a lot of um, people know. So for example, a lot of people in Africa, they also know French and may not, they may not know English. So we figure that if we can use some of these languages, we can, we can do the first round, we make it available and let other people um, fill in with um, other languages. Um, it was not an easy task. It's not like we're just, uh, we, you know, we, we, we realized that we have to find researchers to start this round. Um, and after the tools are built, then it is possible for other people to be involved. And I think it is really wonderful that um, that Peter Lucas and, you know, uh, uh, are, have the uh, are savvy with technology and can do it in such a way that protects the, um, you know, that, that, that is so that you can do it by the people for the people. And I think that is really wonderful. And um, so our approach to make it possible for more people to be involved is to provide the tools so that they don't need to know as much of the technology. Thank you. And Zarek, I want to turn to you. Um, we've also had like a question in the chat talking about um, whether or not your approach in, develop, in developing your project um, with language compression is, is widely um, utilized. And so thinking about these international dynamics, um, you know, could you discuss some of the, the challenges and opportunities that you personally faced when developing this and any sort of insights and recommendations you have for thinking about expanding that nexus of interaction and collaboration between global north and global south institutions and communities. Yeah, there's a lot shared um, across, you know, uh, problems that are shared across languages in the world. Uh, for me, this whole idea of using lossy input to generate uh, better typed output comes from uh, Eastern Asian languages. So uh, Chinese is not alphabetic. And so just seeing all the experiments that have been done in Chinese computing uh, gives people the hope that, you know, Latin centric computing is not the only way forward, that you can actually imagine a new concept. In large parts of the world that have been colonized by Western countries, this envisioning is very hard to do. Um, and so a, lot, a big part of our work is kind of showing people um, alternate realities that can exist if you have a local design approach and kind of harking back to what Peter and, and Monica have been saying, um, having uh, localized populations own their own design process and be kind of participants in the uh, sort of not just data creation, but also human centered design um, gives us the ability to imagine these uh, new realities. Um, for us, this work that I've done for Urdu, part of the reason that we went to the shape-based approach was that so that we could extend to other languages in the Arabic script. Um, so lots of people in Pakistan speak Urdu as a second language. So they speak either Pashto or Punjabi or Sindhi. Um, and so imagining a multilingual future where they could use the same keyboard for multiple languages, that's kind of what our uh, thinking was before we went to this keyboard. And so we could extend the same thing to Arabic or Farsi, um, other parts uh, as well. Um, and as I mentioned, Urdu and Hindi share quite a bit. And so we have all these languages that differ in script, but actually then share quite a bit uh, verbally. Um, today, when you Google Translate uh, from Urdu to Hindi, they're treated as two separate languages. Like the language actually changes as you translate from one script to another, when in fact, there's so much shared infrastructure. So the way that our uh, software looks at the world of culture is actually quite rudimentary. Um, and so what we can do is start exploring uh, better representations in our databases and our language models of the languages that reflect more accurately the cultural uh, development of these languages. And I think that only happens if you have um, uh, locally owned uh, open uh, data sets that people can comment on uh, and, and, and change with their, uh, with their own points of view. Thank you. And sort of a question to everyone. Um, it's sort of related to a lot of the questions we've seen in chat and discussion that we've had. Thinking about the importance of centering community and data localization, could you all discuss maybe different 
practical approaches, um, resources you've consulted with, or have created um, that really help to you know make sure that you know that data is owned, utilized locally, that these folks are able to work with you and with these projects as as co architects. Um, I think many in the audience, and including myself, would would love to hear um, all of your experiences navigating that topic. Anyone can jump in first. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so one thing that we've developed is an app called Rongo. And Rongo is a Maori language pronunciation journey. Um, and I think when Zirak talks about thinking about things differently and dreaming a uh, reality that is not based on the Western uh, way of thinking that many of um, the countries that you know have uh, languages that are, are in decline, indigenous languages that have uh, become in decline as a result of colonization, it changes the way communities think. So we we reached back into our pedagogies and developed something that was based on listening and speaking rather than reading, because we found that when people were reading the language, they produced sounds that were akin to English sounds. But through listening and then getting people to mimic those sounds, we were having a much better uh, result in restoring what we thought um, was a more native sound. And so you can check that out on um, just like just go and download it, the Rongo app. And we have a data sovereignty style of um, letting people know up front what it is they're getting involved in. And if they want to share their data to um, uh, do the, uh, to improve things, they can. But we don't follow people. We don't do a bunch of stuff. The other thing that we do is we created an app um, for the 21 tribal radio stations to um, host their content, to serve their content, and also to have direct access to their local tribal station. And um, we did win um, the New Zealand Open Source Award for, you know, best use of blah, blah, blah in a, in a business. But I think more importantly is it's being used now by people. Um, that weren't using something previously. So those are two very um, current and real examples of uh, how we've done that. One other thing is we've developed a uh, web app called Kaituhi, where you can throw in your um, audio and it will transcribe it now according to modern Maori um, orthography. And it, like I mentioned, it works at about a 10% error rate. We're constantly trying to improve that. Um, but like everything, uh, our efforts uh, aren't as fast as we'd love them to be. But at the same time, we've got an awesome team working on that stuff. So we're very focused on what Monica and Derek have brought to our attention, which is getting these tools into the hands of the people that will benefit from them and for projects, other projects that likewise have a theme of um, needing to get things uh, into the hands of those that are going to use them the most. Kia ora. So Thank you. Yeah. Um, I would like to um, bring up the importance of open source knowledge bases, tools, and technology. So for example, if you look at Wikidata, that is the largest um, knowledge graph, not knowledge base in the world. I mean, Wikipedia is the textual version. There is Wikidata, which is the, the structured data version. And it is contributed by lots of people. And it also includes information from many different languages. Um, and it is a really huge success. I mean, there are no companies that can even come close to the knowledge that is represented there. And uh, if another example is like um, Marian, which is a uh, machine translation. It has 555 languages, as far as I remember last time I looked. 
and there are more there are more trans it, it, it handles more languages than even um, proprietary language translators um I think that working together, we are talking about global AI, you know, working together, bringing information from even different languages together is, um, it, you know, it will change the world in a sense that now you can imagine getting access to all the different kinds of, in, all the different information, all the information using different languages. Um, so I think that that's, uh, that's the direction that we would like to emphasize. Thank you. And see that. Would you like to give uh, some thoughts on that and maybe some some closing reflections as well as we approach the top of the hour? Yeah, um, our approach has been really simple. One was to just, can we make use for technology? Like, can we get people excited about it? Because once we have people that are interested in using the language, interested in using the technology, that creates the demand for building better technological infrastructure. Because uh, it's easier to build better technology for people that want to use it than it is to just build it in isolation. So we went straight away, it was just, we wrote about our work. We've been doing a lot of kind of uh, talking about and getting people, seeing what excites people about technology for the language and seeing the amount of joy that having people see their own cultures represented in language uh, provides. Uh, I think that's a great motivation. And so from that, um, as Monica said, we've relied on, on the power of open source. The fact that our data set is uh, built on contributions from uh, donor uh, editorial bodies that have owned a ton of uh, text and decided to donate it, and that it relies on researchers from across the world that are helping us fix the errors in it and improve it. Um, so for us, uh, relying on that open source resource and improving it and making it better is kind of critical. Um, and so by recentering all of our kind of technical debate about the language from kind of the large Western technology companies into a sort of much more accessible space where people can actually comment and say things like, hey, your keyboard can't type my name. Uh, can you make it type my name? Um, and so even small things like that allow us the ability to engage with more people uh, and push it forward. Thank you so much for that. And thank you everyone for joining us. I mean, this was such an important conversation. Um, and thank you so much, not only for joining us, but for doing the work that you're doing. I know I'll continue to follow on. I encourage everyone to. Um, it really makes me reflect on one of my favorite Olelo no Ia, uh, Hawaiian proverbs that goes, Ika Olelo no Ke Ola, Ika Olelo no Kamake, which is in the life there is a language. In the language there is life, but also in the language there is death. And so thinking about in this comprehensive global way and centering communities is something that I hope everyone you know got a greater insight on and will continue to follow along thank you again for joining us here at hi and for all the amazing work that you guys do hello everybody um good morning welcome again to our event global ai reframing the conversation my name is diana acosta navas i am a postdoctoral fellow at the mccoy family center for ethics and society here at stanford and hai I will be moderating our third and final panel this morning. Uh, so to begin, I want to thank the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI for organizing this event, especially the organizing team, including Haifa, Casey, and Madeline, for taking the lead and opening a space for a conversation about AI in the global context. I also want to thank our speakers for their wonderful contributions and everybody who's joining us this morning. Um, our third panel session will focus on discussing initiatives to use AI to combat misinformation in India, the US, and across 21 countries in Africa. We have the privilege of having three speakers who have spearheaded such initiatives, designing and leveraging technology to mitigate the problems of online harassment and misinformation as they arise in these very different contexts. Let me uh, do a quick introduction of our speakers, and then I will open this space for them. So our first speaker is Tarunima Prabhakar, who is the research lead and co-founder of TADL, an initiative that builds citizen-centric tools and data sets to respond to inaccurate and harmful content in India. Through TADL, she focuses on the unique challenges of addressing these problems uh, in India and the Global South. Her broader research interests are at the intersection of technology, policy, and global development. As a practitioner, she has worked on ICTD and data-driven development projects with nonprofits and tech companies in Asia and the United States. 
Our second speaker, Justin Arnstein, is an award-winning South African journalist and media strategist. He is recognized internationally as an expert in data-driven journalism and related new media technologies. Uh, he is the founder and chief executive of Code for Africa. This is Africa's largest network of civic tech and open data groups. It includes investigative reporters, fact-checking groups, and data scientists. And they, together, they've overseen the establishment of data desks at major newsrooms to enhance coverage and empower citizens, build networks of journalists and technologists to collaborate on in-depth stories about issues vital to Africans, and launched a fact-checking movement that is helping to hold governments accountable and counteract fake news. Our third speaker, Sakir Durumarich, is an assistant professor of computer science uh, here at Stanford. He received his PhD in computer science and engineering from the University of Michigan in 2017. Uh, his research brings a large scale empirical approach to the study of security, abuse, and misinformation on the internet. In particular, he is interested in building systems to measure complex network systems and using the resulting perspective to understand online behavior, uncover weaknesses, uh, architect more resilient approaches and guide policy decisions. Um, so I will open the floor for Tarunima, um, please. Thanks, Diana. Um, just give me a second to share my screen. I think this should work. Oops. Uh, second. There we go. Is everything? Everyone able to see this? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Great. Just wanted an acknowledgement. Um, okay. So I'm going to begin by describing, you know, on this slide, as Diana introduced me, I am the research leader co founder of Tattle. Um, but just wanted to spend some time on this visual because it explains how we look at misinformation. I think we've heard this now uh, in panel after panel that you know um, multilingual content presents its own challenge. Um, India has 21 languages that are constitutionally recognized. People switch between them. Um, they you know will try, sort of use Hindi, but in um, Roman script. So there's a, a lot of sort of mishmash that happens with languages. Um, but also that if you look at misinformation and how it's spread, it's digital. Of course, it's online, but a lot of it is also through mainstream media, which is why we have this uh, visual of a newspaper as well. So the way we look at it is that uh, misinformation and hate speech, uh, it is a community problem and it is a technology problem. And so when we uh, think about solutions, we actually um, keep citizens at the center of it. And that is the introduction that Diana gave, which is that um, how do you build citizen-centered approaches uh, to respond to misinformation and hate speech, um, but also, you know, we are convinced that technology is part of the solution. Um, so we've done a range of projects, but I'm gonna talk about two here, um, just as a way of you know, describing the approach rather than the uh, specific project. Um, I'll also just put the links in the chat um, as and when I uh, come across the, or discuss those slides. So uh, one of the things that you know, we have built is something that we call Peluda. Uh, it's it's after a character in a Satyajit Ray um, series of films, and this is the kind of content that you see in uh, on social media in India, which is that you know people will actually share screenshots of newspapers, they'll share you know uh, images and um, text together. There'll be memes of that sort. But if you see, for example, what happens on uh, WhatsApp is that they share a video, but then below the video will be a text describing that video. So it's not even actually one unit. Um, it's two separate messages that have to be interpreted together. Um, and yeah, again, like a visual of Trump, lots of emoticons and some text interspersed in it. And so the challenge is that when you're thinking about misinformation in India, you have to actually deal with this variety of content. Uh, whereas a lot of, uh, you know, research uh, when it comes to say automated detection of abuse or of misinformation lands of looking at uh, primarily text. So now I think in the more recent past, there's been um, emphasis on multimodal content, but uh, um, it seems far behind what is needed um, in a country like India, but also most countries in the global south, 
where people might not have very high literacy, which is why they will rely on audiovisual uh, mediums to communicate on, on messaging apps and social media platforms. So uh, one of the, um, you know, sort of examples oops, um, that I wanted to show was this, this Disney visualization. Give me a second. It's, it's actually a report that we had done around um, COVID uh, in, uh, and the relief work that happened around COVID-19 in India. And what was interesting about this, you know, at the time was that uh, people were coordinating and sending messages for, um, they were trying to get help and they were trying to coordinate relief work. So people, because the state infrastructure in some, in many ways had failed. And so um, we were just tracking WhatsApp groups at the time and uh, seeing, you know, what was the kind of information, how was relief work being coordinated, but also that, uh, there was a lot of misinformation, false leads, people's, um, you know, private data being, it's because people were sharing their phone numbers, et cetera. Uh, so that being used to sort of stalk them later, harass them. So it was, there was a lot of, uh, it, it is as we call like information chaos at the time. And so this was a visualization just to make sense of, uh, you know, the different kinds of content that you were seeing. And so this visualization is um, clubbing together content that is visually similar Right, but it's it's uh, but also textually similar. So it's actually overlaying both the textual and the visual similarity. And so, for example, we you know we saw a lot of um, it, it just helped us make sense of, for example, these templatized messages. So there were groups that were uh, sharing you know day after day the same, uh, just updating the information, but a templatized message. We saw a lot of imagery about gods and uh, you know because it was a time when a lot of people had started. Um, yeah, evoking sort of uh, and just falling back on uh, religion because there was yeah just not not much um, hope elsewhere. Um, and we saw, for example, screenshots. We see people sharing their medical prescriptions, etc. You can read the full report. I will um, post this link in the chat as well. And uh, you know, this is the sort of place where for us it's not. Uh, yes. Uh, I will do that. Uh, I'll do that, uh, Sanil. I will share it. Okay, yeah. So, so um, just to say that you know, it's the kind of work where uh, you're not trying to say that machine learning solves everything, but it also was a place where it helped us do some analysis. But at the end of it, there was someone who was going through a lot of this data, so it was trying to make sense of the the patterns that um, we had uncovered through some of these APIs that we had built for multilingual and multimodal content. Um, I'm going to again switch back uh, to the presentation. Uh, so the other project that I wanted to talk about is Uli. Um, and I have to say that you know this all of this work is um, a lot of people, Uli had 14 people at some point. So these are not just my ideas. These are also ideas of all the researchers on the group. Um, and so uh, the project was motivated by um, you know, what our collection of data, which where we saw the misinformation and hate speech intersects very closely. And so it really is difficult to talk about misinformation without talking about hate speech in India. Um, and I think that's true globally as well. But in, in India, specifically, when you look at uh, women and people of marginalized genders, uh, you know, the scale of harassment is just disproportionate, uh, even as the uh, resources for the uh, moderating in Indian languages are very scarce. And so we've say, seen this with the paper, Facebook papers that uh, these resources are, uh, these languages are under-resourced. And so what lands up happening is that in any case, the representation of marginalized genders on social media in India is low, but the harassment results in consistent fatigue and um, people actually recede from the issues that affect them the most. Um, and so there's something very odd that happens, you know, with moderation or that is happening with moderation is that you have a group of people who are working on moderation when they uh, and working to label data that um, they don't relate to. And, and it's not something that they experience on a day to day basis. Uh, and it comes with a sort of this high mental toll. While on the other hand, you have people who experience gender based violence on uh, a day to day basis and they feel like the kind of cataloging or archiving that they are doing locally is just their experience is ignored, but all of these resources that they are creating um, and, and they want platforms to listen to them, uh, they, the platforms don't. And so it's it's this odd mismatch that we were trying to 
um, bridge. And so we said that, you know, can you actually denormalize the everyday margin, uh, violence that people of marginalized genders experience in India, um, provide tools for relief and corrective response, but do it in a way that it inverts the top-down logic of platform moderation and it centers the experience of those who are subject to online gender-based violence. Um, and so we worked with activists and researchers. We did focus group discussions. Uh, about a, third, a group of 30 plus activists were involved in uh, this sort of uh, brainstorming and, and ideating on the features, but also that we created a data set of abuse in Tamil, Hindi, and Indian English. Um, so it's about 24,000 uh, text posts, and all of it was annotated by people who were at the receiving end of online gender based violence. Um, so I am going to just now, this is my last slide, just pull back and, and you know, uh, talk about the metaphors that the researchers, so this was Cheshta, uh, who's a qualitative researcher on the team, uh, about six months into the project as we were thinking about, you know, how, how are we thinking about this, what is the branding supposed to be, you know, these were the visuals, this was the mood board that, that uh, the team sort of was converging on. And this was primarily Cheshta because, and, and I think what is interesting is that contrary to the narrative of, you know, AI as this machine that will take everything over, uh, you're really looking at this me metaphor of quilting, right, of, um, of stitching, of knitting. And so there are two layers to this. One is that in all of these um, metaphors or in, all, in, in something like craft and quilting, the human is in control, right, and the machine is helping the human to um, create something beautiful in some ways. But, but the other layer is that it is uh, this notion of mending and this notion of repairing. And so um, we were looking at, you know, the, this general idea of care um, through a machine learning system that where people are collaboratively creating it. Um, and, and it actually works for the community, something that you're building for the, for the uh, community. And so this was, these were the sort of visuals that the designers then uh, built on. And uh, one of the things that Uli does is that it actually redacts uh, abusive words in these three languages and these abusive words were crowdsourced by the activists and researchers and so uh, because these these words which it's a resource that it seems so basic for english it doesn't exist in indian languages so um yeah it basically we crowdsource this list of words and and these words are now redacted from twitter if you have um, udi installed on your browser and uh, one of the things they were saying, you know, the designers were saying was that, can you actually put this uh, patch, right? Like instead of making it completely black, can you put a patch? So it feels like it's healing, it's repair. Um, we obviously, when we sort of try to translate it in tech, trying to, you know, minimize the amount of bandwidth, et cetera, uh, only takes to, to work. Uh, we try to replicate this. Um, and so it doesn't look exactly the same, but it is uh, the same idea uh, mimic in uh, in a more sort of uh, yeah fr front end technical front end uh, visual. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to stop at that and uh, hear from my other panelists and wait for the Q and A. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tarunima, for sharing with us this amazing work. Um, now I want to invite Justin Aristin to share his experience. Um, so thanks very much. Um, as uh, you heard, my name is Justin. I'm uh, formerly a journalist and um, let me just get my presentation up. And I'm currently with a, a nonprofit called Code for Africa. And um, what we do is um, we work across the continent. I mean, all the places in dark blue there, we've got full time um, data scientists or forensic analysts or investigative data journalists who work on a range of issues around manipulated content or um, uh, kind of influence operations. Um, it's 22 countries in total, and we work very closely with a, a larger global coalition, including the Atlantic Center in the, um, in the US and their DFR labs. And jointly, what we try and do is we try and identify coordinated networks that are busy spreading uh, toxic content. It could be extremist hate speech. It could be kind of politicized propaganda that's designed to try and fragment our societies and um, spark some kind of societal conflict. In addition to that, we also support quite a broad range of uh, fact-checking organizations. So the way we tackle this, because it's a fairly complex problem, um, is we've taken a four-pronged approach to tackling disinformation. 
which is a, a more extreme version of misinformation. So disinformation means that there's some kind of intent behind spreading kind of misleading or wrong or inflammatory information. And the very first one is a bit of whack the mole. It's kind of former journalists, people like myself, um, who sit and debunk claim by claim and try and inoculate audiences by saying this was wrong, this is what the real facts are. It's a cottage industry. It just doesn't scale because of the sheer volume of false misleading information out there. And so what we try and do there is rather than producing it as a, an artist's fact for the media, we produce um, thousands of debunks per year, which we then feed into the tech platforms. And they use that to train their algorithms to identify and label this content to, spread this, uh, to stop the spread of it online. So that's the one piece. The second piece where our data scientists do a fantastic job is working with forensic researchers. And we look at the networks and the actors who are deliberately spreading this content. And we try and figure out firstly, who created the content, who's networking and amplifying it in a coordinated or inauthentic way. And then we expose them. The third piece, um, I'm working with folk and partners at places like MIT, um, universities in DC and on the, the kind of the West Coast of the US, um, we use machine learning driven tools, natural language processing, kind of generative AI and so forth to analyze massive amounts of media, millions and millions of media articles per day and try and understand the underlying narratives that are preparing audiences to believe false information when they see it um, on, on, on social. And then the fourth piece is looking at the underlying economy, who makes money off all of this stuff. It's obviously too big a problem. Uh, Africa is a big place. It's over a billion people. It's 52, 54 countries. And so we've built an alliance of people who work alongside us um, at, with similar interests and tackling uh, using similar methodologies. In addition to that, we also then support over 380 newsrooms who do the more kind of handcraft stuff, the fact checking. And what they're doing is an early warning system. And they also produce um, a lot of uh, uh, just examples of misleading information that we can use to train our tools to operate at scale. So that's the back end. Those are the systems that we use. What are we seeing? And kind of what are the threats that we see in the future? So we've all seen this kind of generative kind of um, uh, kind of uh, synthetic media production. This is something that you can buy for $30 from a company in the US. And this is a real example of someone using it for a pro-Russian campaign in Burkina Faso against France and kind of trying to instill um, a kick out of uh, European peacekeepers in West Africa. Just make sure that video doesn't play. And, and that's what people think of when they think of AI driven mis and disinformation. We're saying today that at the moment, it's not a problem. Those videos are very easy to detect and to kind of immediately understand that there's something like really not ringing true here and that it's, it shouldn't be trusted. The bigger problem is something like this website. It looks like a normal website. It's got kind of content that's up, that is updated on a regular basis. It's got a fairly respectable kind of social following of over 6 million people. And it even kind of tells you who the authors are. You click and you research any of these authors. There's quite a detailed backstory. Um, and so you are convinced that this is a legitimate source of news and of content. But then we saw a report come out from Meta back in January 2022, warning that increasingly disinformation operators, both nation states as well as the commercial disinfo for hire folk, are switching strategies. They're moving away from very simple sock puppets and they are now starting to use generative AI and other tools to pretend to be real people and to co-opt, in this case, journalists and make them think that they are speaking to PR, to public relations officers and commission them, which then sparked us to do a slightly deeper dive into this disinformation for hire industry. And then as part of a consortium of 100 journalists and over 30 newsrooms, um, uh, led by an organization in Paris called Forbidden Stories, we started to dig into the people who are making massive amounts of money out of tricking people to consume false content. And what we found very quickly were a whole bunch of companies in Israel, in Spain, in Tunisia, and elsewhere 
who are usually run by former um, intelligence agents. This company, Percepto, is an Israeli company. It's run by former um, officers from uh, Mossad and other agencies. And they created fake persona, what they call deep avatars. These are people, these are personalities, fictitious personalities on the net that look real. They, they feel and they operate as real people. You Google them or you research them as, any, uh, as a normal person might, and you find blogs and journals, and you find them going and doing social things with people. They have hobbies. They, they feel and they kind of, they, there's nothing to say that they are one dimensional. Um, but when you start digging a little deeper, you then find that they're completely fictitious and they're run by a former intelligence agent sitting in, in Tel Aviv but pretending, in this case, a woman called Anita, pretending to be an African-French investigative journalist based out of Paris, who um, claims that she's a campaigning uh, kind of investigator and systematically uncovers what she says are corrupt officials. Um, each of those stories was paid for by a client of the Israeli company, but she has been so successful that she then started recruiting real humans using freelancer.com to work for her and, and kind of grow her reach. In addition to that, we start seeing them creating entire fake media agencies, not just news sites, but news agencies that syndicate content into real news. Um, and people deal with their editors on a daily basis. They think they're dealing with humans, but actually because of the nature of the pandemic, they're dealing with avatars. How do you create something like this? The reality is that um, synthetic media has not got to the point now where it's indetectable to other machine detection measures. And so there's a little bit of human intervention and we see a lot of stitching together of different images and different parts of people's lives to create composite personalities that are then repackaged as real personalities. This avatar ended up employing 17 real life journalists who work in a real newsroom in Burkina Faso without any idea that their boss who they've been reporting to for the far last year is a completely fictitious character. She does not exist. The articles that they produced attacked the Red Cross and um, got to the point where the Red Cross was, had to cease operations in the country and their global director had to fly in to try and explain why they were not actually aiding and abetting jihadists. So that's just one example of how generative AI is simplifying the work that would ordinarily have taken an entire army of humans to create. And it's speeding up their ability to create um, and manage multiple accounts at the, and, and automate the management of those accounts so that they appear to be acting as normal humans. The second example I want to quickly flag is um, uh, visual and, and uh, animated and video propaganda that we see. And so there's a link at the top here to a report. I'm just pulling out two or three examples from that report. So firstly, Wagner, the Wagner Group is a private military company that operates out of Russia. It's owned by a guy called Prigozhin, who until a year ago uh, denied that this company even existed. But the way that they've been shaping the narrative in places like the Central African Republic is producing full length action movies that they then stream and you feel like you're watching Netflix that cast themselves as the Euros and that cast um, Western, NATO, US and other forces as the evil guys and actually cast jihadists as zombies. Initially, there's some inauthentic coordinated distribution of the movie, all those dots in blue that you can see um, on, on the graph, but it starts getting such good traction that eventually it becomes organic and it goes viral. Having built, now those large movies are very expensive to produce. Um, so learning from the techniques, they then started producing very short, like four or five minute animated movies that again, uh, started hitting on these same themes as Wagner mercenaries, as avenging angels who are swooping in to kind of protect ordinary Africans from evil colonialists and kind of NATO powers and zombies. And these videos get massive sharing online, millions and millions of shares um, by people who, who kind of enjoy them as entertainment. But they also start producing satire, such as this video once when one uh, Wagner mercenary was captured by jihadists in Mali. And within hours, they produced a satire uh, video, the links at the top as well, that showed this Wagner soldier 
basically overwhelming and overcoming these two jihadists, machine gunning them, ripping down the ISIS flag in the background. And there's a big US and a big French flag in the background. It's, as you can see in the circle in the bottom, generated big, big kind of uh, engagements. Three and uh, four and a half thousand comments just on this version of the video. Those videos then get um, distributed through these fake networks online. And that video of the jihadist was eventually viewed by 14 million people before Facebook took it down. A lot of that was coordinated by um, uh, automated systems, but a lot of it also then started bleeding into true believers. How is AI a danger in that? Because at the moment, all of those humans who are being paid to do the subcontracting to create the movies, to screenboard and translate the content into multiple languages, and then to also amplify it online, all those processes can now be um, outsourced to uh, generative AI, bringing down your production costs dramatically and speeding up the, your ability to produce this content dramatically. We're already using this to create kind of counter narratives and to try and inoculate people against the false information that's out there. So the final few things that I want to just kind of stress is that we need to understand that the global mis and disinformation um, problem is not just the fault of the platforms. There is a concerted ideological war that is happening in the public space, in the mainstream media, on social media, even in academia, where we are seeing different worldviews pitted against each other. This is a report from Africa. And those worldviews and the research that backs them up are then being disseminated by well-organized nation states and sometimes supernatural national, at least, organizations, including organized crime. The second point I want to make is that this information is profitable. The reason why there's so much of it is because people are making massive amounts of money out of it. So this is not just an issue of ethics or an issue of lack, uh, lax kind of guidelines at the platforms. Both of those are problems. But the reality is that there are entire class of profiteers out there who are using ever better tools and ever cheaper tools to scale this thing to a level where no single country even can try and control or combat it, never mind a tech, a, a tech platform. The final thing is that all of our societies have ideological fault lines. And these fault lines are what provide the fuel that people are using to feed into generative AI and other tools to produce this inflammatory kind of content. And then finally, they learn from each other. They watch each other and they study each other as do anyone else in, in kind of the IT or the AI or machine learning fields. And they learn from each other's successes and failures and perfect and build on stuff that has been proven to work. We've got a couple of ways of combating that, which we hope to get into during the question and answer session. But most importantly, we are also building what we call a doomsday machine. We're using and harnessing some of these uh, generative AI approaches to build the perfect undetectable propaganda and disinformation, and that we use then to train our analysts to try and, and kind of unravel and detect. It's getting so good, so quick, that half of our analysts these days cannot detect this material anymore which means that the platforms and others who are all relying on algorithmic defenses are being left blind to this content. Um, I'm sharing the slides afterwards. I'm very happy to collaborate. Um, the slide back here was we've built a, quite a big database of kind of campaigns with all the materials that we've collected from them to serve as training data for those who want to build inoculation tools. Thanks very much. Back to you. Thank you very much, Justin. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Zakir. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Zakir Drumrich. I'm a faculty member in the computer science department here at Stanford. And historically, a lot of my work actually came from the, I think, more traditional security space, looking at uh, technical attacks that were taking place, not necessarily against people, but against server infrastructures and against organizations. And one of the things that we had learned in the security community oftentimes is that when we look at one organization in sort of isolation or a small group of events, we sort of miss the larger pattern that we can see if we really zoom out and try to take a more global perspective on what's going on. And in the more kind of 
technical side of security, uh, when you're looking at network protocols, we have a lot of structured data. We can see patterns. Um, we can use many of these existing algorithms to sort of understand what attackers are doing, how they're moving, how they're taking over pieces of infrastructure in order to expand their attacks. Um, and uh, what we've been really working on here at Stanford is thinking about how we can take some of these approaches that we've used in the security side to understand kind of how money is flowing between actors, how different actors are related to each other, how their infrastructure is related together, take these ideas and use them to better understand how misinformation is spreading online. Now, this is tremendously, tremendously more difficult uh, for misinformation, in part because we're talking about text and images and video, um, but also in part because they're much grayer questions. Um, what we're really trying to do right now, though, is sort of map how news moves online. Um, as, as social media platforms over the last, I think, couple of years have really tried to combat misinformation, what we've seen is that a lot of misinformation has moved off of platforms like Twitter or Facebook. Not to say it's gone, um, but much of it has moved into some of these more niche platforms. Um, it's moved into niche forums on the web. Um, it's moved into websites. Um, I think as Justin mentioned, we're seeing uh, much of this information comes online for, on websites that look like what could be a news source, um, but uh, the actors have ill intent. And then we're seeing a lot of misinformation also move to distributed messaging platforms. Um, we're seeing it move to, to platforms like um, Telegram and WhatsApp um, to, to servers like Discord. Um, and so what's happened is that misinformation is really spreading across the entire web, which makes it really difficult to understand sort of where is content originating um, what is actually going on, especially if you're trying to make sense of this in real time. And so much of the work in, in the research community has been uh, sort of retroactive. Um, it's been qualitative looking at sort of individual campaigns. Um, what we're trying to understand is how we can take a, a bit more quantitative view and say, can we look at sort of the trajectories of information online? And when we, when we start to do this, what we can see is that a lot of these websites um, are somewhat ephemeral. They come and go, um, but the actors aren't necessarily. Um, a lot of these websites have connections to each other. Um, a lot of times we see actors spreading misinformation in different regions globally. It's slightly different misinformation, but it comes from the same places. Um, we can start to see uh, the relationships between websites, between actors. Um, we can understand what content spreads from uh, sort of disinformation sources where it's actually intentionally um, misleading and how that becomes misinformation. Uh, we can start to see which websites are actually good at amplifying and propagating these types of stories. Um, it turns out it isn't always the most popular websites based on the number of people who visit them that are most effective at spreading these narratives. Um, but what we can see is if you look at this, uh, these trajectories over time, if you look at the, these as sort of these flows of narratives, what we can see is who is good at propagating, who is good at originating content, who is good at amplifying content, how can we start to build platforms um, to understand how this is happening in real time, start to say these are the narratives we see gaining traction. And this isn't... Um, in many ways, detecting if a story is is misinformation or is false. Um, this is something that I think we've actually seen uh, uh, sort of AI tool be very bad at, um, and that's because it's it's really hard, even for humans. In a lot of times, oftentimes there's a kernel of a truth to these types of stories. Um, but we can start to build tools that let humans interact and make sense of this. We can say these are the narratives that we think that journalist needs to look at. These are the narratives that need to be fact-checked before they peak uh, online, um, but start to be able to make all of this information um, understandable, tractable, start to allow folks um, across the research community and the civil society to be able to ask questions about where these narratives are originating and how they're moving around. Excellent. Uh, so Kira, thank you very much for your contribution. Um, we have time for some questions, and I'm going to begin by asking a question directed at Tarunima, but if anybody else wants to chip in, uh, feel welcome. So Tarunima, Uli is based on, on the principle and the idea of capturing the lived experience and the context of the people who have been the victims of online gender-based violence. Um, this required a participatory design process and 
in particular, the incorporation of victims of gender-based violence in the annotation process. Now, can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you encountered in this process and what insights did you gather from this process about how to bring key stakeholders into the design of technology in a way that, as you described, is, is not exploitative, but rather attempts to empower the victims and the stakeholders by creating a technology that addresses their specific experience and their needs. Yeah, uh, that's that's a very deep question, actually, Diana. And I think that's been the the big struggle and um, the biggest, I, I think, the learning experience from the the year of developing Uli. Uh, so I would say that there are two sort of um, like layers of uh, challenges. So one is that you know recognizing that when we talk about a stakeholder and we say that you know the word, we use the word community and we say community uh, centered design or community led uh, solutions, but also that community is not a homogenous entity. There is a lot of diversity of views within uh, this group. And so in uh, Uri, we were working with people across three language groups and also you know, different uh, gender identities. And so they often would disagree and uh, their perspectives uh, could, dis uh, yeah, they could disagree with each other. So for example, um, someone who was annotating in English probably came from a more affluent background or maybe you know um, came from a more urban setting, did not understand the way certain words or uh, certain tropes were harmful and hurtful for someone in a rural part of, um, of India, right? And so there were a lot of disagreements and I think just communicating and learning across these groups uh, within, within the uh, group of uh, gender rights activists that we were working with. And then the other bit I would say is that there's this need for translation between the technical uh, team as well as the community that you're working with. And in our case, we actually had two levels of translation. So there was, uh, you know, me, but then there was uh, who was working with the technical team, and then there was someone who was working, um, a group of three people who were working with the uh, the gender rights activists. And then, you know, I was translating what the technical team was telling me to the um, coordinators who were then relaying it to the gender rights activists. And I think there's a lot um, of uh, sort of um, effort and, and patience that you need to uh, put in to make sure that both sides of so the technical folks and the community can actually uh, you know, be on the same page and be aligned. Um, so yeah, uh, that those were our, our biggest learnings. And I would say it's, it's, it's something that you get better at. I don't think you, you get it right. You, you try and do better and you try and make it more participatory. Thanks very much, um, Tarunima. Um, now, this following question uh, I want to address to Justin. So as Zakir mentioned earlier, um, much disinformation, misinformation today is spread through closed messaging apps such as WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram. And because of the encryption of, of these apps, misinformation is much harder to detect and to counteract. So what possibilities do you see for, for tackling that problem? And do you think there's a way of addressing this issue without completely compromising user privacy in the process? There has to be. I mean, we need to understand that privacy is there for a reason. Um, yeah, I think as the open social platforms, you know, the Facebooks and the Instagrams and at one stage Twitter and so forth are getting better at algorithmically kind of early detection of some of this toxic content. We are increasingly seeing very deliberate campaigns that are funneling people off open social into dark social, so into WhatsApp specifically, uh, largely in Africa, but the same holds true in, in much of the global south. And then also in places like kind of I'm based in Eastern Europe at the moment in uh, Tbilisi in the Republic of Georgia um, into Telegram um, in a big way, both kind of closed private groups in Telegram, but then also the more kind of open groups. Um, the reality is that some of those tools um, simply are very difficult um, or some of those platforms at least to have automated protection or detection tools. So WhatsApp specifically, but there are workarounds. Um, and so you can, for example, run a browser um, a driven version of WhatsApp, and then you can use Chrome plugins that you kind of create, especially to monitor. 
but that's still very laborious because WhatsApp to, to stop the spread of the content they had originally has severely limited the size of those groups. And it's now roughly 260 to odd people maximum per group. So even then you can only have so many tabs open before WhatsApp starts detecting the workaround and freezes you out. So our solution is very old school. We train scores and scores, armies of humans who we call sentinels to kind of, uh, and we insert them into these, um, the most inflammatory or the most important WhatsApp groups. And we develop lexicons, which are basically trigger language. So this is almost what you would use to uh, train algorithms. And then also watch lists. And these are watch lists of actors, organ uh, people or, or, or kind of organizations. And we watch for them to emerge in these groups. The moment they do, they then, those sentinels, which are journalists or activists or civil society monitors, then trigger our investigative teams to have a look. Telegram's far easier. Um, TikTok is another black box. It's supposed to be open social, but um, the reality is they haven't yet built the, the same systems that the, the older social platforms have on the back end. And so even they are struggling and there's no open APIs to work with. Again, the solution to this is building workarounds, almost hacks. Um, the reality is that you're constantly having to rebuild as the platform changes. Um, so this is where people at places like Stanford can make real meaningful inputs because it's so fast moving that you can literally build them as class projects or something that you do in the evening. Thank you, Justin. Um, now, my question for Secure is, your investigation has been done uh, mostly in the context of the United States and misinformation happening within the United States. So what would you expect would be the greatest challenges for utilizing the kind of approach that you use here to bring it outside the US to a say more global context? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think more than it necessarily being US focused is that it's been English language focused. Um, a lot of the misinformation we see or disinformation we see uh, affects uh, Europe, it affects a lot of different places. Um, where we're at right now in terms of, uh, I think, just a technical community is we have language models that work relatively well in English compared to many other languages. Um, some other languages are, are close. We, we have good models that work in Mandarin. Um, but if you start to look at a lot of the uh, communities that are being affected by um, these campaigns, we don't necessarily have models that work at all. Um, a lot of these communities, um, uh, we, we don't have a sense of how to make sense of the language um, of, of what's going on. And so even uh, when you look at the most, uh, I think, popular languages, we see we see disinformation that comes out um, um, from 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 malicious actors in native languages. I um, mean, it makes sense, right? That that's that's how you're effective. Um, we don't have good ways of tracking that today. Um, it's di really difficult to make sense of campaigns across different languages. Um, even working in isolation within one language can be tough, but yet alone trying to understand the differences between different languages is hard. Um, and so it becomes a question of how do we start to make sense of these languages when we, um, in some cases, the researchers uh, don't know the languages, um, but how do we provide tools to folks in these areas that do? Um, how do we start to build language models uh, that, that can work in these affected areas? Um, and then how do we start to bridge across these different languages? Thank you. So now I'm going to open up the floor for some questions from the audience. Um, the first question is, we know that some of the generative AI models are being open sourced or have been leaked. The question is, first, how expensive? And second, how difficult is it for bad actors to obtain a model they can use and then fine tune a pre-trained model uh, or remove the guardrails? Now, oh, feel free to jump in. I don't necessarily have a sense of a cost. I mean, I think we see this happening already. Um, I think we've started to see a lot of um, the uh, some of the content on the sort of these fringe uh, websites are starting to be more generative. Um, and I don't think we have a sense of necessarily what model they come from. I, I defer to the other two speakers here, but I, I get the sense that it's not a matter of cost here. Um, and one thing is that I think we have to compare the cost of using one of these models compared to a human generating the text. Um, and so even if what we consider to be relatively expensive to run massive amounts of text through, 
still is probably much, much cheaper um, than the human labor that may have gone into it. And so it's one of these things where uh, uh, on the defensive side, the costs are much higher than it is to generate the content in many of these places. So just to add to that, um, the re uh, my apologies, someone had their hand up, go for it. No, 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 I can, I, I, since I wasn't talking on generative, I can follow up with you, go ahead. Okay, so um, I think the reality is that there's a drive to lower commercial service costs around much of this enabling technology. So those um, Synthesia videos that I showed, you can literally buy an entire campaign for $30. Now, in the past, if you were going to try and produce something like that in-house, you'd be spending thousands of dollars. So there's definitely the fact that this technology is getting cheaper and cheaper, that the training data is out there. Um, it's not difficult to get hold of. I mean, just even Media Cloud alone has you know, billions of individual articles um, over like a, a 15 or 18 year period that you can use for training data. The challenges around language is, are, are kind of becoming easier to solve. Um, and there are commercial fixes for you to almost like kind of use to retrofit any campaign that you're building. So the only way we're going to compete this is by burning infrastructure and driving costs back up to the level that only serious organizations or serious operators can run at the kinds of scale that we're seeing some of this toxic content spread. And there are very clear ways that, um, that we can do that. Firstly, we need to be rooting out on an ongoing basis, almost think of it as gardening, the, the, uh, the fake kind of persona that they are using to populate on all social media platforms. The older a social account is, the more um, real people tend to assume that it is because they think it would have been uh, vaporized a lot you know, immediately if it wasn't. And so we need to start destroying that digital infrastructure and we need to start um, developing ways of detecting synthetic media. If we don't do that, it's, the price point is going to get to a level where the problem is so big that we literally will not be able to solve it. And the problem is that we then, as a society, lose trust in information sources, in kind of institutions, and even in knowledge or education, because everything has to be questioned. So we need to intervene before that happens. Yeah, I have a little bit of, a, um, I think, uh, tangential comment to what uh, Zakir and Justin said, which is that, you know, while I think that the cost is going to go down, um, and I, I think it's interesting, I haven't, uh, Justin, I'll have to think through what you're saying, that actually you should try and make it more expensive. I, I'm just thinking of all the spillover effects of that. But um, I also think that a lot of at least in India, because you have a lot of uh, labor, right? And a lot of people who are uh, devoted to just actually creating these Photoshop images, et cetera, which I think what uh, Zakir is saying is that it's going to get cheaper to do it through machines. But regardless, I think a lot of the challenges that you're going to see with generative AI, I think we've already been seeing those challenges at a, at a smaller scale. And I think when, um, and, and even that smaller scale in India is fairly big, I would say. So uh, I am actually just thinking about solutions in, in the sort of the cheap face, which is what the, the is the term that John Donovan was using. Um, and how many of those solutions can work for some of these generative AI uh, based, yeah, like content as well. So just thinking about what what is new um, and how much of the stuff we've learned from um, narrative creation and disinformation campaigns of the old. Uh, continues to work with generative AI as well. Thank you all. So one final question from the audience. Earlier this morning, one of the members of the audience asked about the possibility of using technology to equalize power and empower the oppressed. Now, based on your experience and the work that you have done, what are some opportunities, would you say, and what are some of the key challenges uh, in using technology to equalize power? Justin? 
So as a, a recovering journalist, I think my instinct is to do almost anything to avoid um, regulatory intervention. Um, in the world that I live in, government is not the solution. Government is often the predator. And the last thing we want to do is empower them either with the tools or with regulatory um, instruments that they can use to clamp down on, on free space um, you know, to, to articulate or to associate um, or, or kind of just to live a decent life. So I think that um, what we need to be thinking about doing is similar to what um, the health, uh, World Health Organization did during the pandemic is building coalitions of people who understand the local nuance. In other words, understand what, um, while it might be a good solution in Canada, could be a terrible kind of tool of oppression in Uganda um, and are able to moderate what a, an intervention or solution looks like and then partner those people at grassroots level with people who have machine learning, data science, um, narrative analysis kind of um, uh, expertise and jointly figure out a series of solutions that work in a specific location at a specific time. The reality is that there's no silver, silver bullet here. This is a fast evolving problem that metastasizes and changes depends on where you are. And so we are constantly going to be having to um, kind of fine tune and customize our solutions, the local solutions. And the only way we can do that responsibly is by not imposing solutions on people, which is what the, the metas and the TikToks and everyone else are doing, because unfortunately that's cheaper, using you know, sweatshops in Kenya or in India to try and moderate content. We should be doing that locally where people understand the cultural kind of nuance of the problem that we're dealing with. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm going to echo much of what Justin is saying. I think that as technologists, our job is to work with folks who are on the ground, to work with these uh, civil society organizations and figure out how to enable them. I think for folks uh, like myself, uh, we have the ability to figure out how we can use machine learning, how we can use these large language models to provide tools, to provide visibility, to provide closer to real-time visibility. How do we let people understand what's happening in real time? How do we understand, let people understand and track where narratives are originating, what's being discussed in these closed groups. Um, how do we let the folks uh, that need to have this information, how do we get it into their hands? And so I, I think that where I've seen this sort of go wrong in the past is where I see computer scientists try to solve this head on, trying to say we're going to build algorithms that detect if something is misinformation or not. Um, and and I, the reality is like th that is destined to fail. That, that That's not our, our job or where we can be effective here. Our, our, our job here is to work with these folks and to figure out how we can use technology to actually enable them to, to address this because this is much larger right, than just a technical problem. Um, this is something that's politically driven, economically driven. And it's really going to be a question of how do we partner across all of these different areas to be effective long term. Thank you. Tarun Nemo, you get the last word. If you oh, well, thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, it is difficult to uh, sort of top or say anything more than what uh, Zakir and Justin have said. But yeah, you know, I think it is important to know that all technology shifts power. And so um, I think the more that platforms focus on moderation and the more we talk about what platforms should do and what governments should do, I think the more power we are actually giving to them. And so literally what Justin and Zakir said, that like a lot more of the conversation has to be about what we as citizens can do. And I think um, that's that's kind of the bandit of tattle as well. It's it's uh, when you have the era of big science, which you had in the 70s and 80s, and now we're in this era of big tech, I think the burden is also to do a lot more public communication so that the, the difference between the experts and um, you know the citizens comes, comes down because otherwise you don't have sensible decision-making. Um, so yeah, I think just everything that they said, um, yeah, and nothing, nothing more to add to that. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers in this panel and in previous panels. Uh, and to close, I will um, pass it on to Haifa. Thank you all.
Thanks everybody so much in closing again for our speakers who uh, joined us really from, from all over the world and some ungodly time zones. So we're really glad that you could make this happen today. Um, and also our moderators, Deanna Acosta-Navas and Rain Sullivan uh, for uh, moderating these amazing panels. And then the amazing team behind the scenes that brought you the event today. A special shout out to the HAI uh, events team, Casey Peel and Madeline Wright as well as uh, our partners at Stanford Global Studies, particularly Kate Coons and Kristen Hara, who also uh, helped bring this together. Uh, we hope all of you enjoyed the discussion. For updates on future events at HAI, please sign up for our newsletter through the link shared in the chat. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you really have a great rest of your week. Take care.